Let us pray. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the offices of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trusts in this land. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in this house assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to pro promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. Amen. Pray be seated. I wonder if I'd ask your indulgence. Today, Madam Speaker, at this time in particular, because it's a day that the President of the Ukraine has asked for the world to stand and be seen and be heard in solidarity with the people, because as you said, peace matters, freedom matters, people matter. And I'm just asking that we be seen to stand for an extra moment in solidarity with that call. And if other members wish to join, certainly we will do so. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Honorable Minister of Transport. Yes. Madam Speaker, as you may have observed, the Honorable Prime Minister is not with us today. I believe you are aware that he has fallen sick, like all of us being human. One day we will fall sick as well. And so the Prime Minister will not be with us. As a matter of fact, that's, having contacted him, that's what he told me. But knowing the Prime Minister, of course, he may be very well with us here today. You never know. But we want to wish him well. He has been an outstanding son of the soil. He has worked hard for this country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we want to ask that he has a speedy recovery and to be able to join us in the near future. Of course, the work of the parliament will continue. And even in his absence, we will continue to do the work of the people. I also want to register the absence of two of, other, two of our colleagues on this side. Minister Brewster, who is overseas, on government business, and Senator Baller, who again is on some sick leave, and he will not be with us today. So there's where we are at this time, Madam Speaker. Honorable. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, <clears throat> I'm just hearing of from the Honorable Member of the illness of the Prime Minister. I'll just, just say from members on this 
side of the house, Madam Speaker, that we do wish him a speedy recovery so that he could return to do his duty here and elsewhere. Madam Speaker, I wish also to note that the Honorable Israel Bruce will not be here today because he is completing quarantine. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clark, obituaries. Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. I rise to recognize the passing of the following persons from the constituency of South Central Winwood. Pastor Alroy Smart, a great missionary a pastor for over 50 years. The name of the church is Lauders International Worship Center of the New Testament Church of God. He was a community leader, did excellent work with the Basic Needs Trust Fund. We prayed a lot together and he raised children who are soldiers for God. He particularly stressed, Madam Speaker, the importance of youth participation in community development. And his funeral service, I'm advised, would be on Saturday coming. I also want to recognize the passing of Rodan Fargus of Mount Grennan, an excellent painter, painted throughout the country, even in the Grenadines, Union Island. He was a farmer, a very respected man in the community. I attended the funeral service a few days ago, and Pastor C.V. Leisure brought an excellent word. Wilbert Macmillan, affectionately known as Mansa Musa of Fireborn, one of the original members of the Rastafari movement in South Central Winwood, and for those of us who, who know the constituency very well, we have very large groupings of Rastafari brothers and sisters in the constituency, in Greggs, in Diamonds, San Susi, Mount Grenon, and Mansa Musa, was very community spirited, an excellent comrade. Desmond Fiddler and Beresford King of Diamond, then Greggs, Deniston Rodney, Julian Drayton, Elma Matthews, Leota Duncan, Mr. Job, Noella Matthews, and a young man, 15 years old, a student of the George Stephen Secondary School. Buffon Primus definitely has shaken several communities. I'm praying for the family members that they be strong during this period. It's Angela Peters, Rita Sherman, and Rosetta Joseph. It's a sad time for 
many families and uh, I'm asking for different members in the community can provide the, the moral support to those who are mourning. May their souls rest in peace. I'm obliged, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, first of all, let me just say my deepest condolences to the families of those who have lost loved ones in the Marocco Valley over the past month or so. And I would wish to acknowledge particularly the passing of one of the first members of this Honorable House, Mr. Evans Buckley Morgan. He died in Canada a few weeks ago. Mr. Morgan was born in Richland Park in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and he resided in Canada for much of his life. He hails, hailed from Richland Park, as I said, and uh, he became a pupil teacher at the age of 13 years. And at 18, he graduated with honors from the Caribbean Union College, that's the Adventist College in Trinidad. He returned to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and began teaching at Stubbs Government School, where at only 19 years of age, he became the headmaster. It was while teaching at that school that his colleagues encouraged and supported him to run as a candidate for the Parliament of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and he represented what was then the South Windward constituency, and which included the great now constituency of Maria Kwa. Mr. Morgan was the last surviving member of the first legislative council that was elected after universal adult suffrage here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In 1951, that was the year when he was elected, and the, the political party was known as the Eighth Army of Liberation. You've heard about that political party in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He was 24 years of age at the time, and he was the youngest of his colleagues to contest the elections. As a parliamentarian, Mr. Morgan was selected to represent St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953, and shortly after, he resigned his political position and moved to England to further his studies. In 1955, he earned a Master's of Science degree in economics and was recruited by the Shell Oil Company as an economist and served for many years in multiple continents abroad. Morgan relocated to Canada in 1968 and worked as a chief cost accountant with Northern Telecom for a while. In 1970, he was recruited by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, very interesting, to be deputy accountant general, but during his transition to that role, there was a change in government. And with that change, he resigned his post and he went to work for the CDC here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where he stayed for some time. Madam Speaker, he went on to work with the Ontario Ministry of Housing, where he stayed for 23 years. On retiring, he joined the Ontario Conference of Seventh-day Adventists as Chief Internal Auditor and held this position for another 14 years before he finally retired. He was honored in 2019 by the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Association of Toronto for his political contribution to St. Vincent and the Grenadines <coughs> as a member of this country's first legislative council after adult suffrage. And of course, he continued to work um, rending, uh, giving humanitarian assistance to, to St. Vincent and the Grenadines during times of disaster. He was laid to rest last week, and uh, he lives to mourn his wife, Irene, and their children, Gail and Mark, his sister, Elise Rodney, and brother, Samuel Morgan and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Most of his family migrated outside, out of the Marico Valley, and are now living abroad and we like to express our condolences to all of them. May he rest in peace. I'm obliged. Honorable member for Central Kingstown. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I too rise to extend my own sentiments to the surviving relatives on behalf of their departed members. I force, Madam Speaker, uh, on behalf of my colleague who is regrettably absent today because of the quarantine constraint to identify with the condolences expressed by the Honorable Minister of Agriculture on behalf of the several members in that great constituency of South Central Windward, where he consciously also left out a few names, I believe for very personal reasons. Um, it has in fact been a period of time, not just in South Central Windward, but all across the St. Vincent and Grenadines, where we have never heard so many people die. Um, and you hear that comment over and over at funerals. So on behalf of my colleague, Senator Bruce, sympathies to all those sorrowing relatives in South Central Winwood. Madam Speaker, I want to express in a very personal way my condolences to the family of one who I had the privilege to be in his classroom, uh, we may say sit at his feet, he, Professor Selwyn Rang of the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies, whose seminal work in the 70s and beyond is well known, and I believe still continues to today, in particular his contribution, I think to the race and nationalism, I hope I have it right, in politics in Trinidad and Tobago. He passed on a week or so ago at the good, good age of 84, having had a very illustrious innings in educating political scientists across the region and with great success. That said, Madam Speaker, charity begins at home. I, I want to again extend my condolences to a colleague on the other side of the house separated only by political fortunes, and I speak of the Minister of Education, Curtis King. I made a great effort to be at the funeral ceremony of his mom, at which he delivered a very rich and passionate eulogy on behalf of his family and himself on the passing of his dear mom. And I know because on that day, some members on the other side had also another funeral, I think it was that of the, the uncle of the Minister of Agriculture, or grandfather, thanks for the correction. Um, he could not have had as much of his collegial support as would normally have been the case. But again, Curtis, if you allow me just briefly to say that, Madam Speaker, and in the context, my deepest sympathy to you personally and to your family, and request of you to be very strong at this time. Madam Speaker, I was also in Diamonds a few Saturdays ago in the square where another relative of the Minister of Agriculture passed on, Ms. Venice Myrtle Ned, and to him too I express uh, my sympathies. He's had some hard knocks within recent times, uh, even though he's sitting there stoically. We know not what is taking place within is in a recess. That is a very personal experience, Madam Speaker. But Mr. Minister, I express my condolences to you. And even more condolences to your dear mom, who is my great friend, who I know you keep as a secret. <laughs> the other names, Madam Speaker, I go through with a little bit of Speed and time, Miss Jean Charles of Redemption Sharps, a pillar of the community. My condolences to my Vinlec family, Rodney Duncan, Richland Park. Um, I know the Minister of Education was also present there. The other Sinclair, I refer to him as. Rodney was a great guy in the village of, of Richland Park and very well loved in the Vinla community. 
and to his family and to the chief executive officers, his friends, and supporters of Vinlec. Condolences to Janice Bacchus Weeks, whose husband also was once an employee of Vinlec Bashitu. Vinlec, former Vinlec employee, she also went to the great beyond. Condolences to the Vinlec family and to her personal family. To Glenn Alexander Gooding, when you hear Gooding, you think back, way. But when I arrived at Vinlec in 1990, I think it was, Glenn Gooding, one who had distinguished himself at the technical college as a Mr. Fixit, a motorbike and aficionado, was the training officer at the company. And he reported to me in the Department of Human Resource Management, Training and Development, and admin, as it was then. And did much in holding my hand and teaching me the ropes to a successful sojourn at Vinlec. Glenn was of good humor and quiet efficiency. To his surviving daughter, I think it is, I express my condolence and to the people of um, Villa, Beckway, and related areas. Madam Speaker, in recent times, we also lost some other illustrious sons of the soil. I think you're the one who did the, the obituary at Wayne Cecil Crichton's funeral, and that must speak for your closeness, your proximity, and how much you must have been touched. So I express condolences to you personally, and to his family, and to the community of Georgetown and, and Kingstown. He is an all over individual, very affable, and there was a massive turnout at his funeral, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I wouldn't want to say I ran out of time with Francis Newsom Mears of Mark Isil just across the way. He never gave up and invited me to become a member of the Unity Labour Party. His usual comment would be, I'm a good man who could make a more effective contribution on this side. And in mutual respect, I worked overtime to get him over on this time. But we both ran out of time. But he is, as we are told, now in a better place. But it must have been very, very hard, even though they had notice for his family. Um, real, I'm mixing my names, the Moulton was a really wonderful, caring, and generous individual who really has left his handiwork behind in the several architectural pieces, including the NS, which he has left in St. Vincent the Grenadines. I'm sure St. Vincent would be generous and remember his service and his contribution. Because I was on Mayor's Madam Speaker, I nearly crossed my wires and, um, and confused my contribution with one Francis Newsom Mayor's. And, um, and I would be safer if I used the, the name, the man who sang, Woman Gone, Woman Day. Something with which you may not agree, Madam Speaker. Um, but he too made his um, mark in St. Vincent and the Grandines to the Calypso community with that contribution and others. He was also a very strong supporter of the New Democratic Party in a very unique way with his short and crisp contribution in radio stations. No nonsense individual. Rest in peace, my brother. I don't recall whether the parliament did allow us to make a contribution, so you would excuse my reputation if it is here, but Paul Anthony McLaren Velox, Paul Velox, of the Velox family tree, Leyu and um, Richmond Hill, Maurice Road, where is that? I'm not even sure of my geography. But Paul, good soul, good cadet, good, sea, good man at the sea, loved his underwater diving, full of humor, the husband of one of our candidates, Lavon, who was very much shaken up in that old exercise. Again, my condolences on behalf of the cadet community and the NDP family. Grafton Strode Francis, father of a number of individuals, outstanding children, 
but for today I confine myself to Steve, who I'm close to, the manager of Saul, I think it is, former employee and relative of G.W. Frank and Sons, the Frank brothers in Middle Street, for those of my generation. He too made his mark. I believe I am told he might have originally been a Leeward man. I don't think, I think it might have been Bagger, but very good soul. Pastor Kyron, you are as king of Green Hill. Also went to Great Beyond. I extend again my sympathies to his family. And there is Thelma A. Williams. I'm encroaching on East Kingstown. I think I represented at that funeral a burgeoning funerologist member from East Kingstown, Fitz Bramble. That Sunday must have been overtaxed and chose otherwise, but she's also related to the Barnwells, their family friends of mine in uh, Old Montrose. I still that she lives a good and wonderful life. And last but not least, Madam Speaker, the all over individual did so many things in his reasonable run. I'm sure you would have not minded another five, ten years or so. Robert Basil Bong Keto, who served this country in so, so many ways. Well, you would hear the Robert Vincent Keto. That's his crossover from Robert Milton Keto, and I believe Vincent Beach, even though he may not have had that in his mind. That tells you he's all labor, Madam Speaker. But it didn't matter. <laughs> Bong Keto, in Vincent's language, was a hell of a man. Be it on the football field, selecting his money sides, managing football teams, in the football federation, managing, presidenting, representing. He gave St. Vincent soccer, the game of the people, the expression that stays with us. Great motivator, entrepreneur, Kaisonian, president of the Kaisonian Association, made his contribution there. A solid Montrose man. I'll share a little story, Madam Speaker. When I played as a much as a junior on the flannel ball teams in Montrose at the time, I opened the innings. And I was of the impression for some time that I thought I was a good opening batsman. Until some years later, Bong told me, he sent me in to see how fast the other side was bowling. <laughs> well, that was the, in other words, I was the sacrificial wicket. Um, Bobong served with me also in football, and truly, our country, our society is poorer for the absence. You know, it's a long family tree, Randy Cato, who was a top public servant, St. St. Vincent and Grenadines. Uh, he has a brother who is a pastor in Beckway at one of the churches there. And there was another who played football for the national team, Kumbi. Uh, I mean, grammar school days when we had talk war, his, his brother, Big Gem, some of the not so young members, he may know or hear of them, but certainly good, decent Montrose, St. Vincent, Beckwith family. May he, Madam Speaker, rest in peace, and I thank you for your patience. But I assure you, I have left out a good number of obituaries because it seems to be the season. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Honorable Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I too rise to offer my condolences to the family and friends of two persons previously mentioned by the Honorable Member for Central Kingston. The first person being Grafton Stuart Francis originally from Barley, but in his adult life resided in New Montrose. He died on the 27th of January, 2022. And I know him as Uncle Graffy because he was married to my paternal aunt. And I've known him since I was a little girl and I know that he will be greatly missed by his children and other members of his family, and I pray that his soul 
continues to rest in peace. The second person who was previously mentioned is Basil, Robert Vincent Basil Cato, more popularly known as Bong Cato or Bong Sukano, who was my neighbor since I was a little girl and even predating that and was a good family friend and a close friend to my late father. I also extend condolences to his family, his children, who I grew up with. We grew up in that house, in that yard, running and playing. And I pray that they will find peace and comfort and that his soul will continue to rest in peace. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Recognize the Honorable <clears throat> Minister of Public Service. Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, I rise to offer condolences to several persons who that have passed and gone to the great beyond since we last met in this honorable house. Madam Speaker, the first name, which was also mentioned by the honorable member for Central Kingstown is that of the late Edmund Caesar, who is the grandfather of my colleague here, the Minister of Agriculture, Suboto Caesar. Mr. Caesar left Barley many years ago and made Bible the best place on earth for him. Married one of the most beautiful ladies in, in Bible and they lived together for many years. I was at the house just a few minutes after he had passed on. I stayed there with his granddaughters and his son. And I also paid a tribute at his funeral service at the Anglican Church, St. Matthew Anglican Church, by a few Saturdays ago. You couldn't go into Mr. Caesar's shop and call for a marble or a sweetie without having to say good morning, Mr. Caesar. Can I have a marble, please? Without those words, you, you were not being served as little children. But those days are gone now. They, uh, we, we have to bring some of that back. Madam Speaker, I also want to mention the, the passing of the mother of our own colleague, Minister of Education, Curtis King, who passed away a few weeks ago and, and was laid to rest. I also want to mention the name of Mr. Ronald J. Bullock of Yambu, who is the father of Maury Bullock, who passed away on the 19th, on, in, whose funeral service was held on the 19th of February this year. Mr. Bullock was a wonderful gentleman. I was told, in, well, I heard from his eulogy, he had spent 12 years on a as an agriculture extension officer, and 10 years of the as a curator at the Botanic Gardens. Um, and he, after those years, he migrated to England and returned, and, and Jimmy, he had one of the first wooden buses in, 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 in St. Vincent, in Mespo. Um, I, the name of that bus just slipped me. Uh, Inner Circle, I think, was the name of the bus that was was mentioned. Madam Speaker, one Alexander John of Pomset Calder was a 
husband of the lead Jenny Samuel of ULP fame. Jenny passed on a few years ago, and Mr. Samuel died just recently at the good old age of 99, his funeral services today. If it wasn't for the parliament, I would have been there because Jenny and him were, were very good and strong supporters of this wonderful party called the Unity Labour Party. You'd see both of them whenever the party's having an activity, holding hands together and walking down the road to catch the bus or to ensure that Sir Vincent Beach of blessed memory would drive up to Pumset or to call to pick them up to take them to an activity. A cousin of mine and family friend, Brenton Lynch of, of Bible, he was laid to rest last Saturday. And Michael Dabriel, I can't pay tribute without mentioning the name of Mr. Michael Dabriel of the, in those days, one of the first big buses, Cobra. I'm sure, Madam Speaker, you might remember that big bus Cobra Toyota bus, gentleman with a long beard driving, driving that big bus, and also of the gas station fame in, in Georgetown. His funeral would be on, on Saturday. I don't think we did mention the passing, Madam Speaker, in the last parliament. I'm, I'm trying to remember if we did. Stanley Richards, the blind Mr. Stanley Richards, from Georgetown. Um, he was the president of the National Society for, for the Blind for many, many, many years. Um, a wonderful gentleman, outstanding Vincentian citizen. His funeral was about three or four Saturdays ago in, in three or so Saturdays ago in, in, in Georgetown, two Saturdays ago. Um, Madam Speaker, on behalf of myself and this Unity Labour Party, I extend condolences to the families of those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. May they rest in peace. Much obliged. I recognize the Honorable Member for West Kingstown. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would like to join with all members in offering condolences to the families of those already mentioned, and in particular, Madam Speaker, to commiserate with the members on the other side who have lost relatives. Death is that great equalizer that reminds us all of our inevitable end. I'd like to add one name from West Kingstown, Madam Speaker. As a gentleman, I do not in these times regularly attend the funerals for good reason, but I had to turn out to the Sheba Evangelical Church to attend the funeral of a very dear friend of mine, popularly known as Kassan, uh, a member of the Howard family, his late brother George and the lawyer, the diminutive eloquent uh, George brother did the eulogy on behalf of his brother, his brother being uh, uh, two years younger. Kassan lived to the ripe age of 94. And unless you knew him well, you would know that he carried an artificial leg for very many years. And those who go to Fort Charlotte will know that beyond the narrow winding bridge, the narrow bridge as you started climbing up the hill, first house on the right, and he is the kind of person who kept animals and the fruit trees and was a live wire in the community. Uh, he was a very generous and kind human being, and I extend condolences to his children and all of the family members. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for East Kingstown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I also rise 
to express my deepest condolences to the families of all who have departed since this last sitting of the house. And I would also like to particularly um, echo the sentiments expressed to families on behalf of, first of all, Mr. Basil Bong Sukano Kato, who in many respects and in many regards um, <clears throat> played a very important part in my own life as a football president and manager. He was the manager of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines national team when St. Vincent first played any team outside of the Caribbean. That was in the 1992 World Cup qualifiers when we played Mexico, Costa Rica, and Honduras and those guys, those countries. He's also, he was also a very close friend of my mom, and in fact, his entire family, his children, Lana, Isha, and Jomo, were also very good friends, or still are, very good friends of myself and my siblings. Um, his wife, Fern, was also a very good friend of my mom. So there are some very close uh, relationships and, and, and sentiments expressed. I, I share the view of my honorable colleague from Central Kingston that he was very, very instrumental in many ways revolutionizing sports, particularly football in this country. And he will be sorely missed. My deepest condolences to his family again. I also want to echo and add to the sentiments and the condolences expressed to my friend, the Honorable Minister of Education, Curtis King, my friend, more popular, I refer to him as Baffy. We go way back to grammar school. And we, I, it, interestingly, we were competitors um, in the eight and 1500 meters in grammar school. He was in Miller House. He was in Miller House and I was in Lopi. And, that's the only man I couldn't beat in the 800 and the 1500. <laughs> and after meeting his mom, I didn't know his mom until I came back from Canada to get into politics. I met her in Walvaro. She was a resident in my constituency. And I hugged her and she looked at me. She said, um, you know, Curtis King? I said, yeah. She said, that's my son. <laughs> and I think there was a subliminal message in that, in that information, but nonetheless, um, she was a really, really vibrant, a very good soul. And um, Honorable Minister, again, my condolences to you and your family on her passing. And finally, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members, it, it's with extra sadness, if I can use that expression, that I convey condolences to the family of the late Samantha Carrington, better known as Pepper. A young lady, barely in her 30s, she would be buried this coming Sunday from Roseau. She's a former national women's footballer of this country, and she also played netball for Cyan Hill. Very, very sad um, occasion on her passing. She was actually heading a community exercise um, group when she started feeling not so well and never recovered from that. It's really sad, and uh, I would like to express my condolences to her family and to the entire Cyan Hill Roseau community as well. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable member for the Southern Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I rise to offer condolences to all persons in the Southern Grenadines who have lost loved ones during the past month or so. We were experiencing as if it, if it were, you know, people were beginning to get frightened as to what is happening in terms of it seems as if every week you were having two or three deaths in the islands. But I just want to highlight, um, Madam Speaker, there are, there, you know, there are so many names, so many deaths, but I just want to highlight, highlight two. Mr. Ulrich Wright, although he's from Central Kingston, I believe, he had taught in the community of Kanoan at the Kanoan government, firstly at the primary school, 
and he returned years later to be teaching at the Canon Secondary School. It was while you know, conducting a class of physical education with his students that he felt ill and had to be um, rushed to mainland St. Vincent and did not um, survive. And they, you know, the island, the students, everybody took it. So, you know, it was, it was heartening to see the outpouring of um, love from the people of the Southern Grenadines. The funeral was uh, on the mainland and you had, um, you know, classes from the Canon Secondary School who turned up to mainland St. Vincent to make sure they showed their respect. Also to Mr. Hedwig Sandy, came from a very prominent family in Canoan. His father was very much involved in the construction phase and he was the one who taught the young men of the day, the skills and trade that they, that they needed. Mr. Sandy, Hedwig Sandy was a person who had you know, various careers throughout his lifetime. First he was a sailor, I remember having to travel to um, mainland St. Vincent, and they had to use the boat United Knowledge. It was a schooner then, and he was the captain of that ferry boat that operated um, between the islands. He then went into construction. He was the, one of the persons who would have built the, um, the system, the big tanks in the islands in terms of um, Canoan, Miro, and Union Island. He left his mark throughout these islands, so much so that there were many persons from mainland St. Vincent, Beckway, Union Island, P.T. Martinique, Myro, who journeyed to um, Canoan on that day at the hard court where the funeral um, ceremony was um, held. So I give my respects to him for the work that he has done, continuing the trade of his father and ensuring that the young men on the island of Canoan and wherever he was would have been able to um, learn a trade of carpentry and you know the construction work from him. My condolences to all the people of the islands. Honorable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And let me acknowledge the passing and I offer my own condolences to all those whom members on both sides of the house have pointed out um, in, their, in the obituaries. Particularly, Madam Speaker, the grandfather of the Minister of Agriculture and the mother of the Minister of Education, as well as Bonketo. But Madam Speaker, permit me to just add a few names of persons from North Leeward. A few weeks ago, we buried Alpen Edwards, George Akers, who was a former Justice of the Peace in Trumka, Elvira Stewart of Spring Village, and Anesta Rodney of Rose Hall fame. And I want to spend a little time, Madam Speaker, just briefly to recognize the contribution of Anesta Rodney, who was a former educator and also president of the National Council for Women. From a very early age, she started her teaching career spanned many decades and up to her passing played a very important role in the community of Rosal. She is best known or was best known Madam Speaker for her activism as a community activist and one of the critical periods in the development of Rosal as a community and not leeward by extension assisted in the construction of the community center in Rosal. Those were the days when self-help was a thing, and a lot of persons in the communities will get together and, and offer their services to build their community life. She was a facilitator and trainer um, in community groups, farm groups, advocacy groups pertaining to women, 
and really impacted the life, the community life of people in North Leeward. And I do stand with the entire community and the constituency of North Leeward to offer condolences to her family. I did mention she was president of the, the National Congress of Women. And on Saturday, um, Nesta Rodney, Nesta, she is popularly known, will be laid to rest in the community of Rosal. So I too join in extending condolences to all the families, and particularly those I've mentioned here from the constituency of Norwood. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to join with all the members who have preceded me in extending my condolences to the family, to the families of those persons who we have lost since the last sitting of the Parliament, in particular, to acknowledge and to extend my condolences to the Honourable Member as a member of the South, Minister of Education, and the passing of his mother. I also wish to join with the member for Central Kingstown in acknowledging the passing of Paul Velox, who was the husband of a former can of a, <clears throat> a candidate from the NDP in the, in the last election, and now caretaker for East St. George. And we also have the um, passing of Professor Ryan, a fellow political scientist of tremendous reputation in the Caribbean, taught a lot of students, and contributed tremendously to the understanding, the importance of politics, and in, in Trinidad and Tobago, but also in the region. I too benefited from his works, even though he didn't teach me. Um, <clears throat> I wish also to acknowledge the passing, Madam Speaker, of Basil Bonqueto, as the member for Central Kingston noted, he does have Bequia roots. His brother was bringing me up to speed in that the other day, Randy, and uh, his other brother, Cameron Cato, is pastor at the Evangelical Church in Bequia, so the Bequia roots continue, or the Bequia connections continue. And of course, his tremendous contribution to the social, educational, and, and sporting life in St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, is well known and well documented here by other members. I want to just specifically mention, however, three members from my own constituency. Ms. Edla Gurley, that's E-D-L-A. She was the matriarch of my village where I grew up, and I went to her funeral, and it occurred to me then that um, she was the last of that generation. That included my grandmother and other neighbors, um, who were there when I was growing up as a child, and she was the last of them to have passed from that village in Oka. So I want to acknowledge her specifically, Edla Gurley, her passing, and to wish her family God's comfort and grace. I want to also acknowledge the passing of another um, long-standing member of the community now of Mount Pleasant, that's Bertram King, who died recently and was buried um, a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, and he was a quiet man, but you know, very well beloved and a, a long-standing member of the community of Mount Pleasant in Beckley, where I now reside. And of course, Glenn Gooding, which member of Central Kingston mentioned, a Beckley man. I know his family, his brother, his sister, and so on very well to acknowledge his passing as well. And Eldrick. Alo Rage, I don't know if I, I think I may have mentioned this in the house, but not here on the obituaries, from Paget Farm. He was a tremendous uh, asset to the Paget Farm community, particularly to the fishermen, fisher folk, because he was an exporter of seafood and so forth, and so many people relied on him for his service, his business acumen, and he would be sorely missed. Alo was a tremendous person well loved and I want to extend his, my, my condolences again to all of his family members. I believe that's it, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Minister of Urban Development.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just to join with the House and members this morning, all members in their condolences, and I want to identify with Moulton Mayors, Stanley Richards, Wayne Crichton. But there's something bonky to was somebody in the sporting field and everything said about Bong is his jovial character and Bong Sukarno is in Calypso. I want to register in this parliament that Basil Bonkito was the most effective manager of the Housing and Land Development Corporation. I know all his other contributions. You hear Bong before you see him. But when he ran that corporation after Bill Branch, he looked out for the people who needed help. And his contribution must be recorded in this honorable house. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Transport and Work. Madam Speaker, I want to associate myself with the comments of my various colleagues on both sides and the passing of the many persons and since we last met here in the parliament. But I want to express my own condolences to a number of persons in my own constituency. Um, although the name Stanley, Samuel, uh, Stanley Richards was mentioned, of course. Stanley Richards was my personal friend and comrade. And uh, Stanley Richards, I consider to be someone of extraordinary gifts. Stanley was blind, but all along he was guided by a, a walking stick. And uh, it was rather strange to see someone who is blind is walking the streets of Georgetown without any support. Even at his workplace, he got around very well. And so I attended his funeral. And the Prime Minister himself, who also attended the funeral, the Prime Minister spoke and gave the commitment that the market that is proposed to be built in Georgetown, that that market will be named the Stanley Richards Market in recognition of his life and work. Madam Speaker, I also want to express my deepest sympathy on the passing of Mr. Michael Dabrell of Georgetown. Michael was a friend of the Prime Minister. As a matter of fact, that whole Dabrell family would have been and still they are friends of the Prime Minister and very good, good comrades of the Prime Minister. And so he too has left us. Michael, as I recall, he was indeed an industrial person, a business-like person who has been involved in the running of the gas station in Georgetown for many years. And uh, I considered him to be one who has been very generous over the years. He would have worked with the sugar industry when the sugar industry was established back in the early 80s. He would have worked with the Arrowroot Association. He has made great contributions to the Georgetown community. His funeral is on Saturday and that I will also be attending his funeral. May his soul rest in peace. 
I also want to express condol condolences to the Lewis family of Sandivy on the passing of Ozzy Lewis. Ozzy Lewis was a community man in Sandivy. He, he was a builder, and he would have given great contribution in the actual physical building of properties in Sandivy, as well as help to mold the youth in Sandivy. And no doubt also, he was a founding member as to my own support in politics and where I am today. His funeral service was last weekend. He had a great send off. And uh, I want to ask that may his soul rest in peace. I'm much obliged. Honorable Minister of Finance. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Members, I recognize that our obituaries have been going on now for uh, an hour and 15 minutes. and. Um, I thank you for your, your forbearance in that regard, because as honorable members have said, there have been a lot of um, significant passings in, in our shared community in, in recent weeks and months. I, I don't want to add a new name. I just wanted to reiterate the deepest condolences uh, from this side of the house on the passing of uh, Moulton Mayers. There are very few people who get the opportunity to actually change the landscape of the country that they live in. Uh, and Moulton has left an indelible and long-lasting and immediately recognizable um, signature across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, his, his architectural style, his visual language is is very easily identifiable. Um, even if you didn't know Moulton did a building, if you look at it and you know Moulton, you know Moulton did that building. Um, from the community college to the NIS uh, building to his own offices um, here in town and many others. And he was a tremendously inspiring figure. Uh, I've seen Moulton speak to young men on the block who were we'll bemoaning missed opportunities and lost opportunities educationally and the like. And through his own personal testimony, I have seen him energize and inspire people who may not have started in the best way uh, academically, um, but through his own testimony of hard work and, and, and discipline, I've seen him inspire people. And I wanted this honorable house to recognize that almost until his last breath, um, he had been working on a very significant project with the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is the massive CDB-funded uh, school construction project. And even as his health was failing him, he was finalizing designs for the rehabilitation, reconstruction, expansion of numerous uh, schools, nine in fact, across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I, I think that is a fitting final legacy that those nine schools, um, in a matter of a few months, will be able to look at them and say that all of those designs and all of those structures were the final works of a great Vincentian and a great architect. I'm obliged. Honorable Senator John. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, too, want to join members of this honorable house to extend condolences to those who have lost their loved ones, and more so for those persons in the constituency of North Windward. And uh, I just want to add to the list of persons, Mr. Barnabas Thomas of Point, and uh, Miss Marva Lennon of Dixon Village, and I just want to wish their families all the strength that they deserve, and uh, may their soul rest in peace. Okay. 
Madam Clark, congratulatory remarks. Honorable Minister of Urban Development. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I rise to participate in congratulatory remarks today as we are approaching a very important date in the life and times of the Unity Labour Party. Monday 28th of March will represent will be 21 years since the Unity Labour Party was elected on the 28th of March, 2001. Having been in opposition for only seven years, because on the 16th of October, 1994, there was a merger of two political parties, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Labor Party and the Movement for National Unity. And in the February 21st, 1994 election, we pledged that win, lose, or draw, we will merge and form one political party. And it was birthed on the 16th of October, 1994. That year, three seats were won by the then combined opposition in February of 1994. And we put our program to the people of this country. And in 1998, four years later, when we contested that election, had it not been, and I say this with no apologies, for the gerrymandering of the boundaries between West and East and Central Kingstown, West St. George, East Kingstown and Central Kingstown, that the Unity Labour Party would have won that election as we did in 2001. But we lost by one seat. That was June 1998. Our then political leader who has gone to the great beyond, Sir Vincent Ian Beach, one of the greatest political figures in this country, said to us, he's ready to hand the baton on. And on the 8th of December 1998, we held a convention at St. Joseph's Convent in Maracua. And one Ralph Gonzalez was elected as the political leader of the Unity Labour Party. He pledged then that before the end of that term, that we will have fresh elections and that the Unity Labour Party was going to win and that we will be in government for a long time. And the time ain't done yet. Uh, this is only 21 of 24. Because come, come the 2025 elections, by then the Unity Labour Party would have served for 24 solid years. And I have absolutely no doubt, and speaking very confidently, that when that election is held, that the Unity Labour Party would again be returned as government in this country. It is clear from the record that the Unity Labour Party 
is the choice of the majority of persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines for government of St. Vincent. We have proven it on five consecutive occasions. We won 12 of the 15 seats in, 19, in 2001 with 56.5% of the vote. And since then, regardless of what the member for West Kingston is saying, I can't hear him too well. I have. I have. I have. Madam Speaker, since that he has participated in my congratulatory remarks. We have won 12 3, 12 3, 8, 7, 8, 7, 9, 6. That's the record, you know. It's on the tin. You can't take it off. In 2010, all this is going to win because they won the referendum. 13 2. You're encouraging me to go from my text, you know. Their tails flying in the air like young heifers jumping down the road. You know, when I have a calf, Senator, you will know. And they let them go in pasture, the tail in the air running going down. You ain't know about that? Yeah, you ain't know nothing about that? <laughs> well, Lord of mercy. I'm talking half a calf, you know. Half a calf. And when we came in with the victory in 2010 at 8 7, we lost four seats. But we won the majority vote and we won the seats. And we came back. That was the end of the New Democratic Party. And Madam Speaker, for all the achievements that we have made in this, con in, in, in this country and the representation that we have given to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the development of this country, where it's at today and what is to come, one regret I have. Our move in 2009... for constitutional reform and to make this country under Republican status. In this parliament, Madam Speaker, we agreed, the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. No, I ain't done with you yet. I'm coming back to West Kingston. Is that right? I ain't done with you yet, you know. No, no, you're going to throw me off. Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, Prime Minister of this country, moved the motion in this house with much fanfare. Big event. We're launching it, constitutional reform. And we want a president instead of the Queen. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Arnim Yusuf, seconded the motion. And there was a debate in here to go nationally to get this move Done. We said we'll go in national colors. Well, you know, the New Democratic Party color is close to gold, which is on the flag. But it eventually went straight into national colors. We stuck with the, we stuck with the national colors. They went to their party colors. And there was a political campaign against that move by the New Democratic Party. Strange enough, when Mayor Motley in Barbados was victorious without referendum in getting our country accept the Republican status, the New Democratic Party was the first to congratulate Mayor and said it's about time that the Unity Labour Party and Ralph Gonzalez do that for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That's one of the biggest regrets I have, that we did not work together to bring that status to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And for that, you have been paying and paying and paying and will continue to pay. Because the people of St. Vincent had the opportunity. You went against it with your party colors on your platform. I never see more plastic in my whole life. The solid waste was full with plastic. 
after that campaign. And you will pay bitterly because in 2025, let me say this before I say that. This generation of Gomery, Daniel, Ralph, Gonzalez, and Julian Francis, there's a younger generation to us over here. They're the ones who will have to resurrect that debate about turning it into a Republican system here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Are we too old for that now? Gomery came in and part Honorable Minister, uh, Minister pa for Transport came into this parliament at age 46. I came in at 50. We are old men today. 21 years here, I'm 71. Faithfully serving the people of this country and will continue to serve. There are those on the other side who when we are reaching 71 and 73, like us, they're hoping to become ministers of government. Because they're 71, 72, and 66. The three top ones over there, the three older ones. I did the analysis on radio the other night, but I'll repeat it here since you open your mouth. So if at 72, if at 70, if at, you born in 1952, I born in 51, and Sinclair Leacock born in 51. You know? So I, I know the arithmetic. But I going out at 71, 72, 73. You wait until 2025. Where are you going to be then? 73 to become Minister of Government. By that time, you would have been replaced like you all have replaced General Secretaries in the New Democratic Party. This party has been successful from 1994 until 1998 until today. With the same political leader and the same General Secretary. Has not changed. 25 long years. I know, I know, I know. I don't have to be a candidate, you know. From Corwin Morris to Brenton Smith. I remember them. There's about 12 of them. 12 general secretaries have been changed in the new Democratic Party within the time that we have been in government. But our record as a government, as a political party in government, is untouchable in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And there are not many political parties in the region. And I, I might to say the world too. The Western Hemisphere. Who has not achieved 21 years in government with the same political leader and the same prime minister. That's an important factor. A man who has been introduced in this country by the New Democratic Party up and down for every single thing continues untouched. He continues the work that he has committed himself to in this country and will continue to do it even in his sickbed now. His concentration and his eagerness to come out of his sickbed is to continue to serve the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, this political party, having won the last election, which gave us the fifth term, I feel as if there's a re-energizing, as if we, we have taken a fresh guard in cricket. Because the energy I see coming out of this political party now after 21 years, you would think they're tired and they want to lie down and sleep and rest and retire. The program of activities in this fifth term reminds me of first term. Look at the projects we have coming on stream, Madam Speaker. We have a quarry, which we have been waiting on for 25, 30 years. It's starting. 
There's the Marriott Hotel, there's Sanders Hotel, there's the Port Project, there's the Casino Project, there's the Holiday Inn Project, just, just a minute. Royal Mills Project. Honorable Minister, just a minute. I am not sure why the Honorable Member is on his feet. Madam Speaker, I am on my feet because I... We can't I mean, am I supposed to give way? No, I'm just trying to ascertain... You will get your chance to congratulate us, because, just Roman. Because... Madam Speaker, congratulations yes. within Madam all of we talk on our betrays. All well, of we talk on our betrays. Well, then all of us will speak. If the, if, the, if the speaker don't want to rule, then all of us will speak. Because I ain't going to Madam Speaker, is he standing just, on a, on Madam a point speaker, of order? Just a moment. Just a moment. Honorable Member, just indicate to me why you're standing. Well, we can't be both standing at the same time if you're asking me to speak to address you. He well, must sit. No, that is not how the rules go. If you're standing well, well, on a particular... That, that, if, you're on a, if you're standing on a point then of then order... The point of order, Madam Speaker, is that we're under congratulations. Yes. And it's this clear that the Honorable Member has gone beyond congratulations and is in the realm of political campaigning and speeching and besmirching. Okay. And there ought to be a reasonable limit to which that conversation takes place. Very he well. has referred to us as calves and heifers and all, you know, and all those. It's, it's unbecoming. It's unbecoming. Thank and you, it's Mark. difficult to reconcile from a person who says by his own assessment, he's, illegit he, he's not competent, qualified to be a candidate. Oh. But yes, goes on and Honorable on and on members, with his okay. insults. I've heard enough. We I've need to put an end to it. I've heard enough. I've heard enough. There are a couple of things. I have just been given an indication that the... But I'm speaking. I think he's seated. He's, the Honorable Member is seated. I'm speaking. I've just had an indication, Honorable Members, that the court downstairs is in session. So we have to be mindful of that. I'm speaking. Honorable member, I am speaking. No, honorable member. It doesn't work like that, honorable member. When I am speaking, I am heard in silence. Honorable member, I am speaking. I am going to invite the honorable minister to continue his remarks. As we are at the congratulatory remarks. Just a minute, I'm speaking, please. Just a minute, I'm speaking, honorable member. But I'm not finished speaking. I, I am heard in silence. Honorable member? Yes, I, I heard you, honorable member. Thank you. Honorable member, I'm going to encourage you to continue your congratulatory remarks. I'm also mindful of the time and also that we continue under the congratulatory remarks segment. I remind honorable members as well, I remind on honorable member, if you give me a moment, please, please. I have been very indulgent with everybody this morning in terms of because of the last time we sat. So just give me a moment, please. I remind honorable members that we are under the item of congratulatory remarks. And as honorable members properly trained and au fait with the rules, I expect that the remarks under each item will be relevant there too. Please, honorable member, please continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I am congratulating the Unity Labour Party for 21 years of remarkable service to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And in my presentation, I highlight certain things to support my congratulatory remarks. But I, it seems as if the last part that I said that we will, because of our record and my experience in the field, I feel we will win the sixth term. And I said certain things about our ages. I referred to three old men over here and three old men over there. I don't know if that is what got um, the honorable member. Ma Madam Speaker, I am on my feet again. The language and the content and the insinuations of the honorable member is on the boundary of insulting. Age is honor. The oldest man in this parliament is the Prime Minister. Nobody attacks him on his age, his terms of service, 
and thank God that he has had a good and full life. Okay. It's unbecoming of the honorable member to be insinuating that we are here, all younger than the world leaders, prime, the president of the United States of America and all about the world, are not... Honorable, yes. Make, yes you understand I, my point, Madam Speaker? Don't let me get on my feet again. Honorable member, it is your right. Well, provided that I acknowledge you to get on your feet. But I'm going to invite the Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, please, let's move on. Yes, yes, please, madam. I will, I will adjust it to say that we are all senior citizens then. If that is more palatable to the... Because I, I put myself in that class. I said so. The Honorable Member for East Kingstown, I see him smiling under the mask. Um, we understand that you know but madam speaker the performance of this government is second to none in st vincent and the great and the way the party itself structures and goes to the people presents its program it is obvious that we have been accepted as the government for the years to come we are organizing. When we organize an event, Madam Speaker, we mobilize and motivate people to continue to support at a party level. And when we come into government, the programs that we present are very exciting to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Not dull programs about selling of passports and you're going to finance everything and create set workers and so on. And your source, main source of income is selling of the Vincent John passport. Selling your birthright. Well, that has been shafted now. So I don't know what will be the promise. But you see the program we have, Madam Speaker? I just named some of them. But one of the other highlights, Madam Speaker, I want to bring out is to congratulate the Minister of Agriculture on medicinal cannabis authority and the, the work that he has done on getting that sort of taboo off of a good herb. And that carries significant support, Madam Speaker. We have done infrastructural work in this country as a government. The Unity Labour Party government. There's no other political party in and out of storms that have built more bridges than the Unity Labour Party. Check them. I warn the honorable members who live in the Northeast and the Northern section, count the bridges come down to Kingston and those from north, the Northwest, count the bridges come down to Kingston and then go in the interior. I don't want to add the numbers, but we will be remembered as a party and a government to build bridges and to make life comfortable for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I have spoken sufficiently on this. I am sure that there are other members who are in this parliament who will want to extend the congratulatory remarks to the Unity Labour Party on its 21st anniversary in government, including our senior citizens on the opposite side of the house. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. When I got up this morning, and I said the Our Father prayer, after drinking a hot cup of guinea pepper, I did not know I was going to participate in the 
congratulatory remarks today. But Madam Speaker, and I sat there and I listened carefully to Honorable Senator Francis in his presentation. of congratulating the Unity Labour Party, this great party, for its hard work and dedication over a period of 21 years. Madam Speaker, not only would members on this side participate, but throughout the country, the region and the world, the people listening will be celebrating with the Unity Labour Party. I rise to congratulate the Unity Labour Party as we celebrate 21 years as the party in government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I share in this celebration with comrades, friends, and well-wishers of this party. And Madam Speaker, it is a time for celebration, a time for reflection, and as the Honorable Senator said, it's also a time for preparation. As we celebrate, firstly, I must thank Almighty God from whom all blessings flow for 21 years. And 21 years is not 21 days. And I can remember, Madam Speaker, early, in the early days of this administration, there was a, a whisper when some were saying that the Honorable Member for North Central Winwood will be one term papa. It is in that context, Madam Speaker, that I rise today to celebrate 21 years in a country where there was a whisper from the opposition that the Honorable Member for North Central Winwood, that he would not last past one term. I wish, Madam Speaker, to thank Almighty God, and I want to borrow the text from the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And in that day shall he say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. Let this be known in all the earth. And we are to celebrate the work of this great party. When I sat there, Madam Speaker, and I listened to Honorable Senator Francis, and he mentioned the embryonic stages of this party, the Unity Labor Party, and he mentioned the date, 1994. And I recollected, in the year 1994, I was a farm two student at the St. Martin Secondary School. And in 1998, another very important date, I was just a 17 year old A level student. And I am happy today to participate and to participate actively in this party that has been around since I was in secondary school. And I want to thank those who have supported that cause. Madam Speaker, I celebrate 
the struggles, the hard work, the lessons learned, and the successes of all those who, exhibit, who exhibited leadership in one way or the other over the past 21 years in this party, or even before. I wish to remind us of the dedicated work of Sir Vincent Beach, his contribution in Parliament, in his constituency, in the party, in government, and in the entire country. So Louis Straker, a tower of strength, Sister Gerlin Miguel and all other candidates, caretakers, constituency council leaders and supporters who labored and continue to labor in the vineyard of nation building. And Madam Speaker, Selman Walters did an excellent job in the constituency of South Central Widwan, and I want to recognize his work. And the Honorable Montgomery Daniel, member for North Winwood, in this celebration can boast of having participated in the victories of 2001, 2005, 2010, 2015, and 2020. Excellent work, Minister Daniel, in nation building. And it brings me Madam Speaker, to our leader, the Honorable Member for North Central Winward, affectionately known as Comrade Ralph. A blessing from God placed among us to lead and to guide and to encourage and to strengthen, to build and to reinforce that which is in need of bolstering. He has always and continues to be about the work for the betterment of this blessed country. Madam Speaker, while we celebrate, we have to also reflect. Because we can't only be happy for the moment, but we have to understand clearly how we got here. If we do not reflect, we will not be able to fully appreciate the work done and the victories won. In 2001, when this government took office, you had under the ailing NDP more than 50% of the banana farmers having left the industry. When this government came to office, There wasn't any diamond dairy that was already closed. The sugar factory was closed. There was just a small handful of our root farmers and factories were closed under the NDP. The coconut oil factory was closed. The Unity Labour Party came to office in a period when the preferential ero er erosion was unstoppable. And this is no fault of the New Democratic Party. But I'm speaking about the hand that was dealt. There was no direct international air access. So one could not fully explore the opportunities in the island's tourism product. So when we came to office, you had a significant decline in agriculture. And when persons were speaking about tourism, you didn't have an international airport. It was almost like you had a bird without any wings. Children were not guaranteed a seat in a secondary school. Persons studying at universities were few and far between. And Madam Speaker, I had the opportunity to attend the Cavill campus when you were also a student, albeit that I was your junior. 
And I can recall it was less than 15 of us there at Kville at the time. Today, after 21 years in office, we have one of the largest student populations on any campus for the University of the West Indies. There was no garbage collection throughout the country. And today, Madam Speaker, building on the hard work of Selman Walters and the hard work of all the ministers of education, today in South Central Winwood, we celebrate an average of one homegrown medical doctor per village and scores of other highly skilled professionals. And I hear the honorable member for, I heard the honorable member for West Kingston speaking about garbage collection. And I said throughout the country, there was localized garbage collection. Let me explain it. I'm from a village called Diamond, and I grew up in San Susi, spent time in Mount Grenan, New Bronx, Laparin. People used to go by 1914 bridge and throw the garbage over the bridge, and the water coming down from diamonds would wash it down to the sea. Because you did not have garbage collection in the area. That is a fact. You had localized garbage collection under the New Democratic Party. It is this administration that changed it. 21 years is a long time, you know. Madam Speaker, I dealt with the celebration and why we must celebrate. I dealt with the reflections and why we must reflect. And it is about the preparation and why we celebrate we must also pre be prepared. As we mark 21 years in government, the global challenges impacting on small island states are biting even harder. And this is a very humbling part of the congratulatory remarks. We have climate change. We have the task of rebuilding post explosive volcanic eruptions. We have to rebuild St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In the immediate aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, and now we have upon us the impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I wish to declare that we have the experience the courage, the ability, and the mindset, and the love in our hearts to continue to succeed in government. To the farmers and the fishers and the food producers who are listening, the heartbeat of the rural communities, the farmers, the, man, the men who are diving conch in Union Island, the government, we have your livelihoods at heart. Madam Speaker, in this party we have an anchor, an anchor of love for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows, and when I speak about the billows, I'm speaking about all those that we have traversed, be it SARS, 9-11, the global financial crisis, La Soufra eruptions, wars, rumors of wars, the COVID-19 pandemic. But fastened to the rock we are, which cannot move, because we are grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Congratulations again to the Unity Labour Party as we celebrate 21 years. Honorable Minister of Finance, I do believe I saw the Honorable um, Member for, sorry, West Kingston. Don't 
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want, I rise on the congratulations, but I want to place my congratulatory remarks in a proper context. As you know, I have been in Trinidad for very near to a year on medical grounds. And during that time, even I did not have medical leave, there would not have been any cause for me to be alarmed about being a member of the parliament because parliament did not meet in that year in a sufficient number of times for my absence that would have caused you to take action. Madam Speaker, we are in the month of March in this year. We are in the March, month of March this year. And I believe uh, outside of the budget, this is, this is the first time we're meeting outside of the budget. And I want to make that, I want to place that into context about the, the reason for Parliament and what this exercise this morning is about. We have been here from 10 o'clock, at least I was here before 10 o'clock. We have a number of matters to be dealt with. And thus far, we have had to sit and listen to a litany of untruths, self-gloating, and ridiculousness. Madam Speaker, it is therefore absolutely necessary for me, as chairman of the oldest, most respected political party in this country to offer congratulatory remarks to the president and members for the recent convention held at a time when COVID has prevented the other side. So some of them claim from holding a convention. Indeed, the braggarts have not held a convention for very many years. We in the New Democratic Party not only held a full-fledged convention, we were also able to use the electronic media to have free and fair elections and to elect a new team of persons to guide our party in the very challenging work that we must undertake in starving off the negative attributes our people feel consequent upon the very many years of a government that has obviously lost its way. Madam Speaker, we in the New Democratic Party love our country. We are a party for whom the vast majority of these people have given their support in the last election. We are a party who, unlike the other side, that in 1998 brought this country to tears, having lost the election under the terms and conditions that say first past the post. They said and endeavored to make this country ungovernable. That is the party we just heard from, Madam Speaker. They are the ones that caused the pregnant women to have to have their children delivered on the street, cannot get access to hospital. They are the ones that caused a visiting prime minister to have to have the authorities cut the airport fence so that he could gain access to the airport to get out of this country. They are the ones 
Madam Speaker, who caused investors who had committed themselves to bring investment into this country to run because of the chaos created by their post-election dictates and actions, sanctioned by the leadership of the party. Madam Speaker, I listened painfully. I listened painfully to the expressions of the Minister Saboto and the one who regrets having been a candidate, very unsuccessful candidate, despite spending lots of money. I believe spending more money than any other, ca any other candidate in this country and nearly lost his deposit. <laughs> never attempted subsequent to that, never attempted after that for good reason to run again, but wants to come here and lecture us about certain and many things. Madam Speaker, when this noble New Democratic Party was in government, the people of this country saw economic growth unprecedented over the entire life of the party. For the last 21 years, we have seen the flip side. We have seen the lowest growth ever over that period of time. While, Madam Speaker, neighboring countries are doing well. That is what they're boasting about. Madam Speaker, the level of crime under this present regime is again unprecedented. A government that came in telling us about being tough on the crime and the causes of crime, Madam Speaker. A government that took two police officers convicted of crime, appealed the conviction and lost. This is the government that made those police officers go back into the police service as practicing officers. What does that say to us as a people with respect to the laws of the land? Where is the equality? How can we have faith in a police service whose members have been charged and convicted of serious crimes, beating up poor innocent people. And those officers found guilty, put back into the police force. Is that something to come here and brag about? I'm not hearing any thunder on the other side. You see, when we sat here and listened to their folly, Madam Speaker, and the tissue of lies. We have to listen. But I want the people of this country to know. I want the people of this country to know. Just a moment, just a moment, Honorable Member. Honorable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If I, I hate to interrupt the Honorable Member, but just on a point, Madam Speaker, we do appreciate that he is offering congratulatory remarks to perhaps to his party on the hosting of their convention. But it appears, Madam Speaker, he's going on to provide a response or a debate <laughs> to comments made, Madam Speaker, during the congratulatory section. I just want to point that out, Madam Speaker. There's absolutely nothing wrong to go on to talk glorious things about their political party during their convention. But you are responding, Madam Speaker, he's responding or providing a debate during this segment on the congratulatory remarks. Madam Speaker, I would like your ruling on that. Yes. I am going to again remind all members that we follow an agenda as is contained in our order paper 
And we are on the congratulatory remarks. I will invite the honorable member for West Kingstown to con continue with his remarks within the context of the congratulatory remarks. I do thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the truth is a painful thing. Madam Speaker, during the life of the new Democratic Party government, particularly at the time when I served as manager of the CWSA, the transformation of solid waste management took a very positive term. It was under the new Democratic Party government that the OECS Solid Waste Management Project, which was to be housed in the Ministry of Health, was requested by us in the CWSA, for good reason, to be brought into that institution. And it is a matter of record for the Honorable Minister of Agriculture to know. It is that single act which today makes the Solid Waste Management Unit housed within the CWSA the very best of its kind in the OECS. Let me expound on that. The philosophy of the New Democratic Party with respect to solid waste management. Let me give you, let me give you a lesson in where visioning makes the difference. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I recall, I recall when we as management of the institution went before the board of the CWSA, Monty Mall, a former speaker, being the chairman of the board. There was a very lengthy discussion on the pros of cons and cons of bringing garbage into the water and sewage. Madam Speaker, for years, for years, and sometimes people forget that before NDP there was a Labour government, for which, as, man, as, as, an, as an engineer, in the water and sewage authority, I had two years. So I know what labor is about when it comes to solid waste. I can talk to you about that. And that is why I congratulate the New Democratic Party for its visioning, Madam Speaker. Other OECS territories took the advice of the World Bank and established separate entities for solid waste management. All of them are fledgling. All of them are suffering. The New Democratic Party, understanding the issues of collecting fees and the lack of technical and other capabilities within the Ministry of Health, and having developed the CWSA as the leading water entity, in the, certainly in the OECS, decided to combine the efforts of the management, the engineers, and all the capabilities in the CWSA to take that project on and then to manage solid waste. It is true, the visioning of Sir James Mitchell, God rest his soul, and Chairman Monty Mall, and the management team of the CWSA, including a young engineer now doing extremely well in the Caribbean Development Bank, Mr. O'Reilly Lewis, the first manager, local manager of the Solid Waste Unit. So, Madam Speaker, the record of this noble institution, the oldest one by far in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the only one that has succeeded its founding father, only one. only one, the only one that stood up and allowed this country 
Not, Madam Speaker, and I want the Parliament records to be properly noted on this point. Sir James Mitchell, God rest his soul, was under no obligation whatsoever to relinquish the government that was elected in, in, in 1998 because the Constitution and the electoral laws call for first past the post. Never in our electoral history has a majority vote been the deciding factor overall. So it was a very legitimately elected government. It is ironic that this government, hmm, this minority government, this minority ULP government, wants to talk to us about these matters. Our party, Madam Speaker, Sir James Mitchell, Sir James Mitchell, recognizing what harm had become our people and our country from the vulgarity and illegitimacy of those who lost the election, sought to restore faith in the people by going back to the polls. A most magnanimous gesture for which he had no reason, he had no obligation whatsoever. I go further. When Arnim Eustace took over the New Democratic Party, became Prime Minister. He served for a short while as Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, he too was under no obligation to call any fresh election until the term had expired. In fact, the Honorable Arnim Eustace received strong legal representation to that effect. Legal luminaries explained to him that he had no obligation whatsoever to accept any Grand Beach or any other accord because his government was duly elected. And that is the fact. But the Honorable Arnim Eustace, being the man he is, being a noble member, of this great institution said no no he wants no blood on his hand he loves his country he loves his people let us go to the poll madam speaker during the term of this new democratic party which has just Proudly held, pr proudly held its convention, national convention, for which our dear friends around the region and indeed around the world, and all of our members near and far, are extremely proud. We recall, Madam Speaker, what happened when Evan Francis Gibson was one of the government ministers? Madam Speaker, during the era of the previous Labour government and the conditions inherited by the last NDP government, a pregnant female teacher was forced to resign or job if she were not married. Those were the crude laws on the books that the old Labour administration administered. It is a new Democratic Party government, Madam Speaker, that changed that coach law to free up the teachers. Those are the kinds of initiatives that we feel very proud of. 
When the Honorable Terence Oliver and Patel Matthews went to University of the West Indies, Madam Speaker, the New Democratic Party had initiated a very critical change. You know, some of us pretend we don't remember. I went to St. Augustine in 1977. Having done two years at the University of Guyana. And at that time, Madam Speaker, Vincentians had to pay the economic cost in addition to having to pay your tuition and other costs, your meals and your living and all of that. Well, it's no fun. You, if you've ever gone to Guyana, you'd probably have a brain. Um, <laughs> You're clearly not understanding anything, it would be, but better you keep your mouth shut. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I feel obliged to help the Honorable Member. I, I will. I will. I went, I went to Guyana between 1975 and 77 to the University of Guyana. And I did a technical diploma program. From there, I went on to St. Augustine to do an engineering degree. I am, I'm, yes, I agree. So you admit you can't be enlightened. But Madam Speaker, at that time, you see the economic cost to, to, to Vincentians and other OECS people, eh? was a tremendous deterrent to people gaining education at, at the premier institution, UWE. It was the new Democratic Party government, which I'm a proud member of, Madam Speaker, that removed that economic cost. And it is that that started the wave of Vincentians going to, when Terence Oliver was at UWE, the university, Lecturers were surprised at the number of Vincentian students. He would tell you. He was proud to tell them it's because his government removed the economic cost that made it possible for him and others to go to you. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I am privileged. My, my first wife, God rest her soul, being a Trinidadian, I was able to escape the economic cost of UWE in 1977 because I was married to my first wife who was a Trinidadian. So I know, were it not for that, where would I find the resources to go to UWE? Huh? It is after that that the New Democratic Party, the New Democratic Party removed that burdensome hurdle for Vincentians to go to universities. They talk about the education revolution, Madam Speaker. The number of opportunities that the late Sir James Mitchell opened in his administration for people to get training around the world. And you know something they often forget. When the former Labour government refused to recognize persons trained at universities in Cuba, it was the new Democratic Party that employed people like former health minister here eh? and, former ambassador too. and all of them, the new Democratic Party broke ground and employed Cuban trained professionals for the first time here in this country when others were saying no, no they said, what are they congratulating themselves? on frustrating the people in this country. I have to respond, Madam Speaker, to awaken the brains of my dear friend, the Minister of Agriculture, who often reminded us of him having to go to school on a half, on a shift system. And you know, Madam Speaker, the, 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 the government of St. Vincent and the Grandees under the New Democratic Party understood 
the value of education. The, you know, we often talk about what was done. You go around this country and you see how many of the schools, the capacity was doubled. And it was doubled in a manner that allowed no total disruption, but it allowed some flexibility for people to continue their education, even as you grew the plant. Today, this government that has, is, is boasting of 21 years, on the other hand, Madam Speaker, leaves the plants to go to nothing, including the Premier Boys Grammar School and the Girls High School. Just as they're done with the wharf, the port, the port, the New Democratic Party made sure that Port Kingston was regularly maintained. They neglected it since it came to power to the point where we now have to spend hundreds of millions to build a new port. That's reality. But the question of the schools, look at what is happening at Arnesville. A makeshift in a floodplain. A makeshift attempt to repair. And mark you, Madam Speaker, like is well known for this administration. I call them, I call them the Red Drum government. Before this government, this present government, Madam Speaker, if there was a slippage in a the road, there will be some yellow tape. And within weeks or months, that road will be repaired. But the way this government handles road repairs and damages, they put up some red drums and they leave them for five to 10 years before they think of designing a project to fix the road. Madam Speaker, there are places in this country today damaging the 2013 floods that have not been repaired today. What are we boasting about? What? I came to Parliament in 2005, and two years after that, I heard of fixing the bridge at Fort Charlotte. I'm still hearing about the project today. I see it on the box, and I'm not seeing anything. It, Madam Speaker, the New Democratic Party has a track, rec track record of delivering on its promises. Of delivering on its promises, Madam Speaker. And that's why I am so proud to be a member of this noble institution. And I want to assure the people of this country that our mission remains as focused as it has ever been. The salvation of our people, the revitalization of our economy, the bringing back of justice, the dismissed workers unfairly to be reemployed, the value added tax to be removed from hundreds of items, to aid the poor and working class that the other side talk about are trampled upon in this country. And that is why I congratulate the party led by Dr. Friday and my colleagues. And I thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Minister of Tourism. Honorable member for Central Kingston, I've recognized the I've recognized the Minister of Tourism. Honorable 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 Minister of honor, sorry, Honorable Member for Central Kingston. I recognize the Honorable Minister of Tourism. And that's why I'm standing, Madam Speaker. Because before my honorable friend and colleague Daniel Cummins stood, the Honorable Minister of Finance was on his feet. Yes, but that's fine. He no, can but give and way. you asked him to give way because you had got the eye of my colleague. Yes. It therefore made me to feel logically that when he was complete, you would return to the minister. That of is Finland. not. No, it's well, not. Well, you necessary. see, in, in the absence of that, which is a proper and logical interpretation, I have not attempted to stand. 
Not that I would not give it to the honorable minister, but you see, these procedural things can create problems. That's why we're here where we are now. No, no. So I'm so indicating that I intend to speak, Madam Speaker, after so the you, honorable you, you want to catch my eye in advance? I, I, well, we have a whole evening. This is for fleet of foot. I will catch your eye. <laughs> you better believe it, because I'm going to speak okay, today. Just a moment, um, honorable member. To be sure, the practice has developed where a minister, or a member for that matter, if he so chooses, he or she so chooses, can give way. So I have recognized the minister of tourism. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm not sure if the honorable member for Central Kingston wants me to give way to him, um, but you don't? Okay, great, grateful, thanks. You see, the courtesy can be extended. And, you know, Madam Speaker, I'm really smiling because it's a very unusual time during our congr congratulatory remarks to be extending these remarks into debate. And, Madam Speaker, because the Unity Labour Party is celebrating 21 years in government, and of course, the opposition being felt left out of the celebrations. I too, Madam Speaker, will join in extending congratulations to the New Democratic Party for 21 years in opposition. <laughs> because we, we do understand that your sense of impatience 21 years sitting on the other side of this honorable house. It's not an easy thing. And as the Minister of Urban Development, Honorable Senator Julian Francis indicated, some faces in this house, they're getting older, naturally with the age and progression. That's life. But the faces on this side of the house are getting younger and renewed vigor within this government. So I don't understand the impatience and the concern. But Madam Speaker, on a serious note, <laughs> I really don't understand, Madam Speaker, the point. I wouldn't even respond to him. But, no. No, 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 no. Madam Speaker. He's, he's continuing, but I know you've heard me. I know you've heard me, and I've, recog I've, recognized your, I've recognized your apology. Thank you. Continue, Minister. 21 years, Madam Speaker, in government. It's a period in which not just members of this government and the party should reflect on, but the entire country. Noting the contribution of this great political party, its political leader, to the development and advancement of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, we have been blessed to have a political leader of immense quality, a cut above the rest. His brilliance, his vision, and his stewardship of this government and this country over the last 21 years. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, our flag is flying high. And I've had the opportunity on several occasions, even while as a senator, to travel to many a meetings with the Honorable Prime Minister. And in every forum, They listen particularly to his counsel. 
When there's a concern at the OAS, it is St. Vincent and the Grenadines, every leader in the America stone too. When there is division at some occasions in CARICOM, it is St. Vincent and the Grenadines that leaders in the region turn to. So it is indeed fitting, Madam Speaker, after 21 years, to pause and reflect on the contribution of our political leader and prime minister and this government in the development of this country and the recognition that St. Vincent and the Grenadines now have on the global scene. Madam Speaker, I want to also touch very briefly on two important developments over the years of this Unity Labour Party. When this government assumed office, I think I was just leaving secondary school, but the period prior to that, Madam Speaker, during my primary education, in the days when banana was gold and there was capital and revenue coming into the country, I'm not blaming anyone, but I'm simply putting into context the facts that existed. I sat in a classroom, seated and on the floor of that classroom, a wooden floor, it was a two-story building in the Trumaca Primary School, and I could look through the cracks and the missing wood in the flooring. And below, I can see students in the lower classes on the ground floor. That is my reality as a student. And I pause on that, Madam Speaker, because what followed thereafter the education revolution, the transformation, I too, as a product of that very education revolution, you now stand here in this parliament, in the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Madam Speaker. Because of the advancements we have made as a country in education, particularly under the Unity Labour Party government. Madam Speaker, housing, and you look at the transformation we have seen, and you drive across the length and breadth of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, particularly in areas in Fitzhugh's, in Rokes Hill, in Cumberland, in Peter's Hope, New developments, low and no income houses, thousands of them built over the years to provide suitable and proper and decent housing to working class people in this country. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture alluded to it. Because we're talking tourism and a lot of times we say, well, why is it that St. Vincent, mainland in particular, we have not seen the type of development in tourism. And you make the comparison with other countries, but they have had over two, three decades an international airport. Hotels being built many years ago and an established 
tourism sector. Since the completion of the Argyle International Airport, not just in tourism, but the amount of investors and developers we're saying St. Vincent is now the destination to go to. That's the emerging market now in the Caribbean in terms of development, particularly in the tourism sector. And none of that would have been possible without the construction of our largest capital project, the Aragail International Airport, under this Unity Labour Party government. Madam Speaker, listen, I'm not entertaining you right now. Eh? I am on my feet. Madam Speaker, when I look at this, no, you're too disrespectful, you. I am not entertaining you right now. Honorable members. When you look at this. Honorable members. Honorable House, Madam Speaker, and the transformation we have seen in, no, oh, Madam Speaker, the Unity Labour Party government, and I want to go straight to the point. They came in at 12.3 in 2001. Another term at 12.3 in 2005. What do you think? Well, in 2010, 8.7. And you would imagine after three terms, this is a government that is slowing down and Caribbean politics natural order is that you transition out. In 2015, 8-7, again at the polls. And then the opposition and their financiers, those who are they are willing to sell the passports to, on the CBI, the Citizenship by Investment, who is pumping monies into the opposition, they say, well, we have them now. There's no way in a fifth term the Unity Labour Party government will ever survive. After two terms out at 8-7, just a one-seat margin at the polls. There's no way they can survive in 2020. We have them. We went to the polls, Madam Speaker. A government going for a fifth term a historic fifth term. We were able to turn the tide around. And when you thought that the Unity Labour Party was declining, I went to North Leeward and I took a seat from the NDP and brought it over here on the Unity Labour Party government. Whether it's by one or 100, we took that seat from you in a fifth term. When this government, when you thought and your finances thought, that this government was on the decline. We are now on the ascension. Because when you look at the faces on this side of the house, you have Curtis King, the Honorable Minister of Education has been added. The Honorable Minister of Mobilization, Orlando Brewster. You have the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, who is now a seasoned minister, but still youthful. And then you have the Honorable Minister Camilo Gonçalves. You have also Senator Peters, who is emerging. Bala, Morgan, all of the faces that are here are fresh faces emerging and ascending. And this political party, when you think we're out, we're now starting. So it's another five years, and another five years after that, because these members on this side of the Honorable House, we are going to stand here 
to protect the gains and the hard work of our political leaders. We are going to stand here and ensure that the New Democratic Party, in this lifetime, do not cross and come on this side of the house and in government. That is something that we are determined to make happen. Madam Speaker, I want to identify very importantly the contribution of a number of senior members of this political party and who served in government. So Vincent, who is now gone, who, Madam Speaker, our first political leader, and who, during the right moment and the right time, gave way to 21 years of Ralph Gonsalves. And he had the humility and the experience to understand and he said it himself, this is the man who will lead St. Vincent and the Grenadines forward, and we have to support him. So we have to recognize St. Vincent. And every star has a number two. Right in shotgun, you had Sir Louis Scraker. And everywhere... You care you careful I don't talk about stones in here too. <laughs> then you had Sir Louis who really made a significant contribution. Longest serving Minister of Foreign Affairs. And a man who has given human service, left New York, came home, and he said, Look. I can stay in Wall Street and I can work as a banker and a financer, but I want to come home to St. Vincent. As, as with all of us, has given our time and effort and our energies and uh, what we have to offer to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And you had all of the other ministers, I wouldn't mention them by name individually, but every single person in and outside of this parliament who give up their, their service, their time to this great political party, I want to thank you. And I thank you because you were able to give this country a party and a government that has seen and brought about the transformation and the development and advancement in our country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, just to conclude on that point, we, and I spoke of 21 years, it's not a easy feat or when you have to get up every single day for 21 years as a political leader and prime minister and captain the ship despite of all of the challenges, economic shocks, global financial crisis of 08, Hurricane Thomas, the climate change issues that continue to affect us, a global pandemic, the eruption of the last of Ray. In every moment and season, a leader is given the task to lead. And our Prime Minister has lived up to those expectations and has steered us through, Madam Speaker, these challenging times. And I want to thank him for his service to this great political party, but more importantly, to our country and to our region.
Madam Speaker, the future of this country and the future of this Unity Labour Party has never, ever been more brighter. Because all the men and women whom I've mentioned here, including those who are current, like the Deputy Prime Minister who has also been here in this house for just as long as, as the period, who still offers his wisdom and his experience to a number of us who are now coming in and coming up and learning. But the contribution that is still very much available, the reservoir of talent within this political party and in this government Is still flowing. And we have a commitment to continue the development and the advancement of this country. And I am ensuring, I'm working with all of us on this side of the Albany House to ensure we continue the gains and to ensure that this country is led by a government that understand what leadership is, understand what it is to work in the interests of the working class, understand how important it is to provide opportunities for the people of this country. Madam Speaker, finally on another note of congratula congratulations, I also want to Extend congratulations to the Honorable Renee Mercedes Batiste on her fourth election to the seat of the Speaker of the U.S. Assemb Assembly during its sixth sitting in Antigua and Barbuda last week. It was very humbling and fitting to see Madam Speaker The Honorable Rene Batiste was given, again, so much years of, of service to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Being recognized within the OECS and the quality of her performance over the last three elections of the Speaker of the OECS Assembly, they found it fitting to have her re-elected for a fourth consecutive term. And I want to extend my congratulations to her on that election. Madam Speaker, humbly obliged. I recognize the member for Central Kingstown. Madam Speaker, let me express my gratitude to you for this opportunity to speak on the congratulations. Like the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, I didn't anticipate that I would be on this subject this morning, and that's where we would be at this time of today's proceedings. Be that as it may, Madam Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to congratulate this wonderful party, the New Democratic Party, the oldest political institution in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, on its recent celebration of 42 years 
or some may better put it, its 42nd convention, at which it had the opportunity to reaffirm its confidence in its current leader, Dr. the Honorable Godwin Friday, and at the same time to renew itself with the appointments of erstwhile candidates and young candidates too. I think of our General Secretary with a good history and track record, our Treasurer, and our Public Relations Officer who is yet to deliver to St. Vincent and the Grenadines her abundance of talent. And I suspect it will only be in a matter of time. Madam Speaker, when you get to my age, the proud age of 70, there's a lot of learning, understanding, and appreciation that you apply to life's activity. Let me concede, madam. Let me state emphatically. Age is honor. And I don't want to ever find myself assaulting the elderly and senior statespersons in this country of ours, upon whose backs we thrive and stand today. Had it not been for their contributions, there will be no us here in this parliament of theirs in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I salute them all. But with age, Madam Speaker, comes wisdom. Madam Speaker, as had been referred to by the Honorable Tourism Minister, Carlos Gonzalez, Carlos James, I'm sorry, James, I am misled because Minister, 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 Minister of Finance has stood, so Carmelo, yes. There's value in wilderness experience. You're able to reflect, Demonstrate patience, introspection, find yourself, understand honesty and integrity, and apply your heart to wisdom. Madam Speaker, very often, I get disappointed by this Columbus experience that I hear coming from my colleagues on the other side of the house. You would believe that St. Vincent and the Grenadines was discovered in the year 2001. And that all that went before it mattered very little. We heard today on the obituaries, the contribution of Mr. Morgan, the Eighth Army, and we can go on in this historical journey, the Joshua years and Kato built on Joshua, and Mitchell built on Kato. We need to understand the uses built on Mitchell. And yes, Gonzalez has made his contribution too. And Dr. Friday will take us to another level as well. That's the natural trajectory of life and politics, Madam Speaker. We need to understand and appreciate that. I think it was the mighty shadow, Madam Speaker, who best responded to this Columbus theory. And he had a beautiful song, Columbus Lie. Columbus Lie, Lie, Lie. Wonderful rhythm, wonderful lyrics. If we digest that properly, you may be able to guide us, Madam Speaker, as we contribute in this parliament. I'm not going to, I'm not ashamed in any way at all, you know. 
of my 70 years of experience. So let me take the mystery out of it because it seems to me that it's either the Minister of um, Urban Development is in love with my age or, or contemptuous of people who get to this grand old age. Or I don't know what it is. Actually, the Honorable Member for Honorable Speaker of the House of Assembly, OECS House, is of the same age. He went to school since age four, Miss Deshaun's school. But it seems that her oh, elevation to speakership, renewal to speakership of the OECS a month after she was senator here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Very much in the way that the manager speaks of a comedy country, a comedy community. Is to be acknowledged and celebrated. But my principal stand here in a party of over 42 years is cause for condemnation. My record speaks to itself. I dare any of them on that side, from the Prime Minister down, to challenge my service in this country, volunteerism, throughout the years. Cadets, Chamber of Commerce, Employees Federation, Football Federation. And yes, with all my imperfections, I have my bruise and wash to show of it. But I persevered and guided behind a principle which has directed me to stay faithful to the cause and the cause of the New Democratic Party. My 20 or so years, Madam Speaker, in this parliament, therefore, serving the New Democratic Party has substantially been in the defense of the democracy of this country and of constitutional rule. Amen. And in the process, I have been battered and bruised like so many Vincentians to ensure that that principle stayed alive. We're still the only country in the Commonwealth in which you can't have a constitutional vote on the confidence motion. Something to brag about? No! You hang your head in shame. It's still a crime in St. Vincent to have a placard on the streets of Kingstown. Or to carry a drum. Was this Putin land? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, What's all this talk about 12, 3, and 8, 7, and 9, 6, and whatever it is? Let me say emphatically, you know, emphatically, first time I contested the election in this country, and I lost the set by 14 votes. I won my seat. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. Let me tell you something. Boy won Central Kingston, Honorable Ken Boy. He never won all of the polling stations in Sharps. Campbell won his seat in Central Kingston. He never won all the polling stations in Sharps. Sears won Central Kingston. He never won all the polling stations in Sharps. I won every single polling station in Sharps and came out with a lead of 206 votes and lost the election. Check the statistics. But I'm not the center of the discussion today, Madam Speaker. What is important that we lost in 2001 by nearly 10,000 votes? And in the last election of 2020, we pulled back all, all 10,000 votes and became the majority and party of choice in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And that, Madam Speaker, after having over 5,000 people leave in this country, taking the belly and make boat, to live in Canada and BVI and Barbados and all around the world, and to disrupt families. Many grieving families... But I believe our time will come to say it doesn't trouble me, that it doesn't worry me when I hear statements being affirmed in here, in this, hall, in this hallowed hall, that they will win the next election in 2025. I'm scared because on every election, the Minister of Urban Affairs is released from this Parliament to become a member of the electoral staff and to guide the elections in this country. Method in their madness. We heard today again that not under this current regime would we come to government or words to that effect or expression that suggests that. What are they going to do? Cook the books? A lot of talk is outside. We know what are your feelings. We know what your emotions are. NDP must suffer and die. Yeah. Well, we're not going to die. 
We are alive and well, and will prosper and survive, and will transform because there's hope for a better St. Vincent and the Grenadines with the New Democratic Party. Madam Speaker, why am I so in love with my party, the New Democratic Party? Why am I in love with the party, Madam Speaker? The principles and the policies. I am still enamored, Madam Speaker, by that great social transformational program. That's a word everybody likes to hold on to, you know. $84 million land reform project Amen. that created land for the landless in the beautiful constituency of South Central Windward that allowed many the educational opportunities they never could have dreamed upon right. to give them land to empower them to allow some of the dependents today to come in the South and to talk a lot of nonsense. The Leeward Estates as well. But that position of Sir James Mitchell, the pioneer, the visionary of land for the landless, creating an economic democracy, was not a standalone event. It was this new Democratic Party that properly applied the acquisition of land for a public purpose, that acquired the Michael Lands in the villa area, that gave birth to what we now refer to as the community college. I can speak about that when I came back here from university. Because I was young too, you know. I was young too. And I dare a lot of you who beat in chest and thump in the chest to do what I had done when you're at your age. At 28 years, I was in charge of evacuation in this country for the Sufri evacuation. In my 30s, I was leading this country to football supremacy in the Caribbean. I was present in Geneva when we became members of the International Labour Organization. Young man. But one day, one day, one day, all of us will gain a little bit more wisdom, I hope. But time will pass and the age will count. And we will no longer be disrespectful of becoming 50 and 60 and 70. I remember the little boy, you know. He didn't even want to hear about a funeral. And you heard about 21, you whistle. You hear somebody 50, you whistle. But yes, I've made use, and our party is making use of time. No one, but no one will question. The changes brought about this country in the utility services. Just a moment, honorable member. Honorable Minister for Urban Development. Madam Speaker, I rise speaking? on a point of order. Point of order. Because I left the house, Madam Speaker. Yes, please. While I'm speaking, I'm fully vaccinated and boosted. You are allowed too, but you keep wearing it. You don't read the protocols. Um, I know. It's okay. I heard the Honorable Member for Central Kingstown report, repeat a myth that has been carried by the chairman of the New Democratic Party continuously, and I wish today to put it on record that I have asked, I'm asking the honorable member to withdraw the statement that every election, I join the electoral staff I think it is as far from the truth, Madam Speaker. There's absolutely no foundation in it, but it was created by them and perpetuated by them. And I think we put a stop to it today. That I ask, uh, since that he has been bold enough to make that statement in the parliament, that, Madam Speaker, I ask that it be withdrawn. Yes. Honorable Member for Central Kingstown, the Honorable Minister is asking that you 
withdraw this statement? And Madam Speaker, I would not like Joshua say that after you draw the nail and you withdraw it, the hole is still there. I am not like that. And I concede that the member, honorable mem member for, well, he's not, he doesn't have a constituency. I nearly made another error there. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's why you're so good. I concede that the Minister, Minister for Urban, Urban Development. Development name will not appear on record on the payroll of the electoral office over any of those electoral periods that I have voted to. And that it is a political stress to say that you are a member of their staff. It may be more accurate to say that he was involved, and I don't know this for a fact, but it is well believed that he may have had a hand in how things are going. But even that, in the spirit of things, I will not yes. suggest. I stand by my thing that Madam Speaker, he was there on staff. The Honourable yes. Member mumbled something there. I don't know if it's in French, English, or Spanish. But, Madam Speaker, I hold my demand for withdrawal of the statement. Because it has been repeated so many times by the New Democratic Party and it continues today. It's time that it comes to a stop. It's not an overstretch of your speech, political overstretch. I wish the honorable member to state the matter factly that well i am asking the speaker yes. to demand it of you, demand of you that we get a withdrawal of, of that statement Ma madam speaker i mean we, it, in the interest of time the honorable minister of urban development was never an employee of the electoral office and any statement that i make to the effect that he was so employed is erroneous very well please move on he formulated it by saying that every election I become a member of staff. He never said anything about, about, said about being paid, you know. A man could become a member of staff and not be paid. I want that part, Madam Speaker. That is how he stated it, and the Hansard would record it. Yes. Every single election, the Honorable Member, Minister for Urban Development, is joins the staff of the electoral office. That is what I'm asking. Member for Urban Development, you're obviously enjoying yourself. Let me be explicit. Whether you're paid or unpaid, your name will never be seen as having been employed by the electoral office. You were never employed there. I Neither did you offer services for free. I can't be clearer than that. So anybody who wants to insinuate that you worked at the electoral office will be wrong. And I, I, I'm conceding to that. So, Madam Speaker, I want to hear the formulation. No, you're going too far. I hear you're, you're by... Going, you're going too far now. Madam Speaker, you're going too far now. the rules of the House don't allow you to make up, to, to restate it. It demands... The rules demand that it be said, I withdraw the statement. Madam Speaker, am I correct on the rules? They are, you are indeed. Honorable Member, I think that you have been most cooperative on this. And you have also indicated that in the interest of time, that you will do what you must, having recognized certain things. So let us follow it to the letter of the rules and withdraw the statement. Speaker, I see you are very much in that vein. Madam Speaker, I would even be more generous than that. I acknowledge the pain, suffering, and hurt caused to my colleague on the other side of the house in the incorrect statement yes. that he was an employee of the electoral office. And, and, and accordingly, I withdraw that statement. Thank you. Continue now. Continue, continue now, honorable <laughs> member. <laughs> Madam Speaker is making a point that one of the things when you've been around with a political party of over 40 years of experience and had 17 glorious years, magnificent years in government, 
is you can salute and measure the services by a number of indices. Utilities is one of them. Electricity. We had less than 50% of this country with electrical services when the party came to office. When it left, it was 96%. I believe that water, it might have been of a similar standing. Pit latrines, etc., were the order of the day. Um, and that brings me to a point, you know, because, well, well, I see something, these guys just buy trouble in them, because in, in my time of study and research, you can go and you can look at the, the censuses, and those censuses used to run in 10 year periods, 70, 80, 90, to 2000. We're in 2022 now. We didn't meet in 2010 census deadline. We have gone past the 2020 census, and we're not even in the process of, as best as I know, doing a census. But the census would have shown that Water Authority, like, like electricity, did marvelously well. And of course, the record of my colleague here at Water Authority is stellar. Everybody in the Caribbean have drawn on his experience and his wisdom at the Water Authority. So we made Vincentians comfortably in their homes with the water and electricity, and I'm not going to draw in the solid waste debate. But I have reasons to believe in the arguments of my honorable colleague from West Kingstown. Madam Speaker, infrastructural development. Big things, little things. Ranging from the Gucci tracks that they decried and have tried to rename and rebrand. But putting pride, dignity, and decency in the small man, the back wall, the drains, the footstep, um, the pathways. These are things that help to bring our people. Literally speaking of the dirt, there's a time, you know, Madam Speaking, St. Vincent the Grandines, to leave home and go to work or to school. You had to have two pairs of shoes, the one you wore from the home to the paved road, and the one you had in the back, in your bag to put on when you got to the paved pave road. So we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. In the Grenadines, the infrastructure of wharves in Beckway, remember for Southern Grenadines, you're still talking about the situation in Canada 1. Now you see it, now you don't. Um, but Sir James did a lot of work there too in the infrastructure in the Grenadines. Roads, roads galore. Ha. We talk about a tourism project. Agal International Airport, flagship project, one that I still salute and support. <laughs> but had we not built the ferry boat, there would be no Grenadines transportation and development of the ferry service in the way we know it now. There will be no cruise, cruise tourism industry and sector as we know it now. These are landmark development projects for the New Democratic Party. Madam Speaker, in this country of ours, who would say that Sir Vincent Beach didn't make a contribution to the country? And there are many others. We go back. Tannis, Hudson Tannis. They have a number of people. Randolph Russell. On both sides of the fence, we've had stolen political contributions. We have Sir James, legend in his time. Eddie Griffith, heart gave way at a political meeting. John Horn, Jerry Scott, Stal Watts, Carl Dugan, Louis Jones, Farnell Campbell. And we could go on. So both sides have their list that we can roll them out. Not, we ought not to be in this comparative things as some didn't and now they're doing. They are the beneficiaries of solid foundations built by the New Democratic Party. And hadn't they had this very, very rich inheritance? They will be in, I don't know what will become of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, in my lifetime, in my 70 years of living, the worst experience I've ever had is that which led to the Grand Beach Accord. 
civil, divis, div, civil disobedience of a kind, degradation in the rule of law. I heard my colleague refer to the fact that when Pandey came here, they had to cut a wire through the Annsville fence for him to get to um, Sunset Shows. That's a fact. I was in those discussions. And that, that leads me, we in Grand Beach, that leads me to never, ever, did this blessed land come so close to civil disorder. I was in Grenada, you couldn't even pass close to a colleague. They pulled in and they carried on. The unions had their say. At that time, Madam Speaker, at that time, Madam Speaker, the unions in St. Vincent were at war with the government. And they so had the right to do. The Constitution speaks about the role of the public service union. They were doing what they thought was in their best interest, representing the workers' interests. Unions at war with the government. Today, Madam Speaker, in their glorious 21 years, it's the government that is at war with the unions. I don't recall, and I'm stand, I, 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 I'll, I'll take the correction, but I've never seen the unions having to occasion after occasion after occasion take their government to court. Collective bargaining with the government is a thing of the past. And they are a labor government. I'm proud of that. Disgraceful. Shameful. Teachers had to go to courts to get their rights. Public service unions had to go to the rights. Otto Sam had to go to the courts to get his justice. And today we'll come on to the Elvis Daniel situation, you know. The duplicitous nature of the administration that once sought to stop him from eating a bread. So they wanted to promote themselves as being the vanguard of giving them a sandwich loaf. I'll speak to that on the pensions bill. But that, Madam Speaker, was when governmental decency and hygiene existed in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Tell you something, you know. Well, let me say it differently, Madam Speaker. Because I have recovered that much that people don't remember what I went through, you know. I talk from history, you know. Yep. I was a senior manager at Vinlec. And so, and so Vincent Beach, who had said that he not speaking with water over his mouth, said that once you got into government, I would be without a job. In two hours, I had to take in my keys, hand over the company's vehicle, and give up 10 years of work because I was dismissed in two hours, summarily dismissed from a job that paid me nearly $100,000 per year. How do you live with yourself? And you're talking about this glorious government. When Marcus Defratus had to go to the courts to try and recover his monies for the property that you took away from him. And nearly 15 years, a person who was owed two, three million dollars can't get two cents out of it. And you live there and do nothing about it. And beat your chest and talk about decency and honesty. No Vincentian has ever suffered so much pain and suffering as Marcus Defratus. So James had to go to the Privy Council. Two cents had his own experience. What are you going to tell Madam Speaker again? I'll sit. has stated clearly that on the acquisition of the Marcus Defratus property, that up to this date, not a cent was paid, the records of the government show that $1.7 million was paid. The balance is owing and is in arbitration. Those are the facts. You ain't gonna get an apology on this one, Madam Speaker. I don't Look think an apology was a Because being if asked. Marcus got $1.7 million 15 years ago and you're arbitrating for him for 15 years, 
If you're arbitrating with him for his balance, which is more than 1.7 for 15 years, my story still stands. You're unconscionable. Well, I'm glad you agree. But you can, if, 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 if you're going to stand and say that you agree that you are unconscionable, I'll give way. Ma Madam Speaker. If I'm you're going to say that you agree, otherwise state a point of order. Because you are part of it. And is your family? Madam Speaker, I rise on a point of order further. Yes. That I was correcting the situation, or the statement that the Honorable Member made, which was not factual. The rest of it, that's all. I want it on the record yes. that it has been repeated so many times. Again, that, and he commented, the Honorable Member coming to the House today and repeating that myth and untruth, I just wanted to correct that record very well it's now on the record very well honorable member i go no further my brother is he looking for a correction madam speaker because no, I he's, he's he's just me he's he's making the correction and the point he is making assist me madam speaker mm -hmm. is that over near 15 years ago a matter went before the courts of marcus Schrader's whose line had been compulsory acquired and that subsequently he got 1.7 million dollars of it but since then He's been owed in an on or wrong $3 million interest growing, and he's not caught a single cent of it. No. The no, he's, he's not speaking to the latter part. He's not. Well, you, are, you, are, you cannot conflate the matters with, and then expect me to rule without separating them. So I think you are correct that he is correcting the statement that you made yes. that the, uh, the gentleman had never received any money. Yes. Because you did say that. So yes. he's making the point that a payment was made. Yes. He makes the additional point yes. that there is a balance yes. due and owing which is still the subject matter of an arbitration, which is still to be determined. And Madam Speaker, I, I accept your, your, Very well. your, your, your help. And yes. I, I think you would have heard him say as well, it is unconscionable to be owned, Marcus. I didn't hear him say that. Do you want to hear him say it, Madam Speaker? I don't. I, I, because think, I, sit, I think, no, no, just I, a I'll, moment. I'll sit and allow him, you know. No, no, no. I can only hear what it is that the honorable member said when he rose and that is the the extent of my should i ask him if he wants to, to be able to say it no speaker. i think what we are we, we have to ask what we what i want to remind you honorable member i see you're in a fantastic mood today no my, but what i want to remind you what i want to, you, to, I want to remind you laughing. i think you're all laughing but what <laughs> i want to remind you of honorable member for central kingstown yes madam speaker is your very timely intervention yes when that same honorable mem the honorable minister of urban <laughs> development yes was making his contribution that we we maintain and re be reminded that yes, we are under congratulatory remarks congratulations Mark. and you had at that time also reminded yes, madam speaker. that I must not only comment on the time, but yes, the content. So I've com commented on the content, and I will now comment on the time. Yes, Madam Speaker. I mean, I understand the spirit yes. of debates, but I also yes. understand that you are as a seasoned yes, Madam Speaker. parliamentarian. Madam you Speaker. will want to get back to the, the yes. confines. Uh, because, Madam Speaker, I am assured you will not allow this to happen in this house again. You know, next oh, time, you'll nip it I in the bud. I can't wait for, all us, for you, us all to go you, to private nip, caucus. You'll nip this in the bud. So, <laughs> so we are on the congratulations, Madam Speaker. Yes. And I am supposed to just ignore, not ignore, pay attention to time and address this question of content. Yes, as you had so rightly raised. So quietly raised, Madam Speaker. Yes, thank you. So, in my summary, Madam Speaker, while today we in the New Democratic Party are seized of the fact that the governing regime is appreciating themselves, loving themselves for being in office, is it 22 years or thereabout? 21 years or thereabout. We in the New Democratic Party with 40 something years of political wisdom would not be unmindful, would not be caught out by the fact nor would we rest on our laurels that having secured, or better put, are the representatives of the majority of incentions in this country. They love, more people love the New Democratic Party than love the ULP. That's a statement of fact. As measured by the polls. But we will not lose sight of the fact that the next elections is all about constituencies. All about the constituencies. 
So I would not travel the road that my honorable, he used to be my friend, you know, Madam Speaker, many, many years ago um, at an institution. <laughs> I will not travel the road, Madam Speaker, where he went into a lot of economic development. You know, I, I listened to um, a program last evening, Madam Speaker, that made the point that the existing agreement to go to Richmond, to Quarry, for example, was predicated on the fact that we're building a new water, new, um, a new deep water pair in Kingston. That's in the contract. You, you, have you seen it, Madam Speaker? But it, it, it's kind of unknown or unheard of that a private investor will want to predicate his or her investment on the fact that the government is going to build a deep water pair. It also smacks of corruption because you're using a government's project to take to your bankers to say that, finance me on the strength of that. Finance me on the strength of that. All of my quarry material will be part of this $600 million investment for a new port in Kingston. I don't think that's what they meant, you know, but it's what can be inferred. And if you have light ears like mine, you smell something. Vincent will say, smell a rat. Madam Speaker, don't take this. I ask my honor, don't take this party for granted. I don't know many, how many more years I have left. And my time is not my own. But I'll put whatever remaining years that I have to the service, first of the people who have given me the temporary privilege to represent them here, Central Kingston and to the wider Vincentian community. To see that this country gets the kind of government that I had experienced in the 80s and the 90s. When government policy was driven by a sincere interest in the poor, and the working class. And that's across the board. I spoke about economic programs, the educational programs. My colleagues spoke about what happened in social services. You know, you know if, you, if you can talk some very personal things, you know, because you get some Johnny, Johnny come lately contributions in here. I remember when I was teaching at the grammar school, you know. The female teachers at that time couldn't wear pants. Yes. Not a pants. They couldn't wear pants to school. It was a victory. When the females were allowed to wear pants to school. That, that's how long we've come. Yep. I can go on and tell you the, the amount of things that couldn't happen. You know, when you talk about corruption, there are many ways. And I'm putting some of your notice now. Don't test me in it, you know, of how stink the corruption is. I have a, a private business. And when I was fired from Vinlec, they chopped off every single contract that I had with government. And for 20 years, 20 years, I have not been able to get on the open market a contract with the government. And everybody who worked with me, borrowed my equipment, borrowed my tools, borrowed my workers, secured contract with the government. I went into the Labor Department a few weeks ago and saw a flow in the most despicable condition. And they told me a contractor here was delivering that service and had been paid. I said, yes, you do? I said, do what? I walked back to my van and walked to the yard and took out a piece of rag and cleaned the flow in less than a minute. That's the money we spend in this country to hide our corruption. Yeah. There's some others, you know, and they will be revealed. How many government contractors, how many government ministers today own a private company? How many own bulldozers, front-end loaders, excavators, trucks? 
How many have private companies in their name? How many trust companies do we have in Leicester Stein? All across the world. Stop the stress beating, stress thumping. And this whole, and Switzerland. Switzerland, you said you have yours? You have one in Switzerland. Well, power to you. Power to you. You have. Hello? No, I, I decline. I, I decline. But the I Minister of. Agriculture says his trust is in Switzerland. Remember the congratulatory remarks. I, I just well, I, I was going to congratulate him. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Madam Speaker, I have taxed you, but I have made the point. As the IMF said many years ago, with respect to the New Democratic Party, much to please, little to fault. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it is one thirty. Five in the afternoon, and we haven't gotten past obituaries and congratulatory remarks. Yeah. And like the, min the Minister of Agriculture, I wasn't going to participate here, but I had so much time that I managed to jot down a few things. I wasn't going to participate because my granny used to say self-praise is no recommendation. But it seems that that has been thrown out of the window today. And it seems that congratulatory remarks is now the vessel into which we shoehorn political debate. Maybe we need to amend the other paper so that maybe once a Every couple of months, we get to get these things off of our chest because it seems that there's a need for some people to pontificate to a larger audience than the echo chamber in which they usually inhabit. I'd like to congratulate, first of all, Madam Speaker, the officers of the New Democratic Party who have been elected to their respective positions in the party. Democracy demands that we have a vibrant party system, at least two parties. And they are serving, as always, as a useful foil to the winning team of the Unity Labour Party. Every Usain Bolt must have a Tyson Gay to drive him over the finish line a little faster. The member for East Kingston is a basketball fan. There was a team called the, the Harlem Globe Trotters, and every Harlem Globe Trotter must have a team called the Washington Generals that they beat every time they go out into the pavilion. So they serve a useful purpose, and I am grateful that their internal mechanisms are such that they have hired uh, or selected new members. I want to congratulate as well the honorable member for West Kingston, who seems to have regained his health quite well, and I want to congratulate him for that. It seems, Madam Speaker, that very soon, given the energy I've seen displayed today, that the special accommodations made for him would no longer be necessary, and I'm very grateful for that. and accept and believe that that's a genuine comment on the part of the Honourable Member. After all, Madam Speaker, my continuing injuries and, suffer, and, and suffering are the direct result of the inflicted pain by the opposite side in this Honourable House. And it is a matter that is before the court, that's why I keep it quiet. But if we're going to offer Congratulations. I, I think it, 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 is, it is sad 
that it should be genuine and not, not comical. Members of this government, Madam Speaker, have sat and allowed their youth arms to have skits making a mockery of my injury. And if anybody wants to apologize, they're so to, free to do. My gradual return to health, thanks to my family and my medical team, I thank the Almighty for. What I don't want is any untruth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable member, honorable member, I must, I must indicate that it is my considered opinion that the sentiments expressed for what appears to be your having regained your health and which by your own admission you are on your way to recovery were sentiments which were genuinely expressed. Truth be told, just a moment, truth be told, and we will not have a debate on this. Truth be told, I myself was quite happy to see your agility both of mind and body today. I really am, um, and I, 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 it, it was on my agenda when we, t when we take a break to say to you, as I've always said, you're looking well. So I must, again, I, 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 I trust that no one makes a mockery of anybody's health. And I've never had that from any either side of this house. And I continue to wish you continued recovery. But I must insist that the Honorable Minister continues at this point in time. Madam Speaker, with respect, I, I am the only one, apart from my medical team and my close family, who know the medical condition I am going through in, in detail. And every day I thank God for being alive. Because the extent of the injuries inflicted on me could have seen the end of my life many years ago. Honorable member. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, finally, I don't want to cast aspersion on anybody. But I am saying there is a team of people who have never one day apologized for having inflicted that injury in me. Honorable and therefore, member. I do not accept Honorable any member. of their comments. Okay. I don't want to hear it. Honorable Member, and that is completely different. I that is something completely it. different. I don't want to hear it. So we've heard that you haven't accepted the well wishes, and I invite I the minister to continue with his hypocrisy. congratulatory remarks. I do not accept hypocrisy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I assure you, even if not the Honorable Member, since he doesn't want to hear me on that, but I assure you and this Honorable House, Madam Speaker, that my sentiments were completely genuine as were yours, as expressed. Um, so I, I, I'm really at a loss as to why this is, this is a point of controversy here. Um, nonetheless, Madam Speaker, I'd also like to, before I get back to the, the main reason I stand for congratulations, I would like to also congratulate the New Democratic Party, as, as evidenced today, for so firmly and securely building their own echo chamber, and so lovingly viewing the past through rose-colored glasses, that they have yet to understand why they were voted out of office and why they remain out of office for 21 years. Because I heard a spectacular litany of accomplishments. And the fact that they have yet to come to grips with that warms my political heart, because it tells me that if they can't come to grips with what took place 21 years ago, it bodes well for our own political future on this side of the Honorable House. Madam Speaker, but I rise in congratulations, mainly related to this March 28th date and this 21-year anniversary, to congratulate our political leader We've had a lot of congratulations of the party, the Unity Labour Party, and I join and share in all of those congratulations, the collective, everybody who's in, been involved, and to offer my sincerest thanks to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the opportunity that they have given this party in successive elections to govern. But I rise specifically 
to congratulate the man at the helm of those 21 years, the leader of this party, the leader of our government, Dr. The Honorable Ralphie Gonzalez. Because, Madam Speaker, it was his ascension to the office of Prime Minister that placed him in the position, and every leader is shaped by the events and what they inherit. And not in any argument that over any lengthy period of time, any government will accomplish some good things. Because the fact that you're in office for a long time suggests that you're accomplishing some good things. So I would never say that the New Democratic Party never accomplished any good things. That, 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 that would be a silly statement. But they were voted out for a reason, and they remain out for a reason. We can debate whether the reason is their bad performance or all good performance, but that is not the purpose of congratulatory remarks. And the Honorable Prime Minister came to office at a time when he and his government had to make a choice. They had decisions to make about whether to transition from a dead end colonial single crop export economy to one predicated on services and competitiveness and innovation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And it is always easier to maintain the status quo and do what everybody before you did. And it was remarkable, the energy, the vision, the boldness of the Prime Minister and his government to break with the past and enable St. Vincent and the Grenadines to chart a new developmental course. And we can list the accomplishments, Madam Speaker, and not all of them, it's 21 years. But we know that the Prime Minister was integrally involved with the creation of the International Airport at Argyle. We know that, that it could not have been achieved without him. We know that the Prime Minister was intimately involved with the construction of the Rabaka Bridge. And we hear all these talks about the wonderful days, but we forget when people had to pull up their pants foot or live on one side of the river and not the other. I heard people, I heard people talking today about the horrific breach of public order and public safety in this country at the time of the demonstrations against the incumbent government at the time. The same people, Madam Speaker, who said they're taking the peace out of peaceful protest, <laughs> having these challenges now, understanding the, the loss of order. The same people who are unable to, to even acknowledge the blood flowing from the head of a prime minister in this country a few months ago. But Crocodile tears are for another time, Madam Speaker, because all that speaks to the measure of the man who has led this country for 21 years. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the act of universal access to secondary education, something that was deferred, I'm not talking about the opposition, deferred by the World Bank for days, years into the future, 2020. Imagine just two years ago, they were forecasting universal access to secondary education. And we have secondary education universal access since 2005. Thank you for the leadership of the same Prime Minister that I'm congratulating today. The economically disadvantaged student loans, the learning resource centers. People know a learning, what name learning resource center? The record show talking about paying economic costs, that when that same Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez took office, the outstanding bill at the University of the West Indies for unpaid economic costs was over four million dollars. Eight million, sorry, eight million dollars. Unpaid for years. These were the challenges that he faced and everybody faces challenges when they come. But we congratulate him for the manner in which he dealt with the challenges that he faced at the time. Over 1,500 homes built. When the previous culture 
in this country was that home building was not the job of the state. That was a fundamental shift in philosophy. Possessory title to land, the Possessory Title Act, lives to live, the building materials that people used to say is a bribe and a this and a that for vote. Now everybody expects their government to assist them if they're vulnerable and in need of these supports. The Windward and the Leeward Highway, all the bridges that the, the minister, the former minister of transport and work spoke to. The modern medical diagnostic center in Georgetown. The plot, the polyclinics all around the country, the smart hospitals, the national library. I mean, we could go on, you know, Madam Speaker. The Belle Isle prison. Talking about housing even our criminals in some level, with some level of humanity. Solid waste, since we're talking about Belle Isle. The landfill is up there too. I am now old enough to remember when the first thing you would see entering St. Vincent and the Grenadines was a festering landfill at Annasville at T.T. Joshua. And right behind that garbage dump was a massive quarry in the middle of a residential community in East Kingston. I'm old enough to remember I'm not casting any explosions on any one party or the other. I don't want to hear who did it when and who did it before and who did it after. But from that period, flying in, your first view of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, an open garbage dump, and a quarry in the middle of a residential area at Annasville. Now, you fly in to the Argyle International Airport. There's a proper landfill and solid waste facility in Belle Isle, and the quarry is not located in the middle of a residential community. That's progress. We have to recognize it. Sometimes things like 21 years is a time when you can step back from the politics and all the cotton trust and say, this is an accomplishment. Let us take stock. Home help for the elderly, the expansion, tremendous expansion of the social safety net in this country. There's no doubt about it. And when we talk about more people on social protection plans, they say, oh, you're trying to create a set of defendant people, welfare recipients. But from a non-existent system to a, to a system that exists, helping the disabled, helping single mothers, helping the elderly, helping the weak, of course the numbers will increase. And we are proud of the discipline and focus of our leader to make that happen. Madam Speaker, congratulations for the YES program, the SET program, the PRIME program, all the other programs innovatively created to support young people. The Zero Hunger Trust Fund, the Contingencies Fund, which helped us out of tremendous difficulties just when the, 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 the volcano erupted. The expansion, you could go wrong anywhere now, the plain fields, the hard coats all over this country. The strengthening of Nemo, where they were about to pull out money and shut down Nemo in this country. Where would we be when that volcano erupted if not for Nemo? Congratulations, Prime Minister, for Nemo and strengthening the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and strengthening the lottery, creating Braxa, establishing the Hugo Chavez fuel facility at Lomans. Minister of Agriculture could talk about all the fishery centers that have been built. The Prime Minister himself could talk about the new police stations. I love to bend that corner at Kittel's. When you drive into Kittel's and you pass what used to be the police station and then pass what is currently the police station, which has in it a modern CCTV system deterring and monitoring acts all across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you, Prime Minister Gonzalez. Congratulations. The stewardship 
of this country through a pandemic, through a volcano, through tropical storms, through floods, through hurricanes, with a strength and a discipline and a focus that benefited every single Vincentian. Little things that aren't so little, free Christmas barrels. There's no a standard and an expectation, not only in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but in other countries. We have to step back sometimes and say congratulations for coming up with these innovations. When a GDP moves from $790 million to $2.2 billion, you say congratulations. When per capita GDP moves from under 8,000 to over 20,000, you say congratulations. We could debate electrification and water because I don't have my census in front of me, but my recollection of the numbers is not as um, rosy as some. But I know the census indicates a spectacular increase in home ownership and that the quality of the homes has increased. The number of people who own homes has increased tremendously. The number of people who own concrete homes as opposed to what land have homes has increased tremendously. These are empirical facts that we have more than doubled how much money we spend every year on health and more than tripled how much money we spend every year on education are empirical facts. And we say congratulations to the Prime Minister for making those things happen. Congratulations for the pivotal role in good governance. Colleagues, I'm old enough to remember now when this very event of live broadcast of Parliament couldn't happen. When people who tried to broadcast the people's business were chased out of here, Glenn Jackson of blessed memory spoke about it many times. <laughs> the era talking about people working in electoral office, the era when a chief electoral officer and a candidate in elections were siblings and are not casting any aspersions on them. But imagine what people would say now. Sustainable development. Principled, non-aligned, progressive foreign policy. Those are words that were never associated with St. Vincent and the Grenadines for decades before Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez came into office as Prime Minister. Solidarity with social democratic movements all around the world, particularly in Latin America and in Africa. Nobody can dispute that. Nobody can dispute our unparalleled activism on climate change. I will never forget, Madam Speaker, in the 2015 election when I read the manifesto of the opposition in 2015 in a small island developing state they didn't have the phrase climate change but they had the word austerity you see what is important and what is unimportant the work we did on the actions defending Haitians when the Dominican Republic was passing unjust laws against Haitians, when we got involved in that and took a leadership role. The foundation of Alba, of Selak, of Petrocarib. Our, our participation, the smallest state ever in the Economic and Social Council in the United Nations. Never before a country this small in charge of economic and social activity at the United Nations level following immediately the smallest nation ever to be elected to the United Nations Security Council. Because we have a leader who we're congratulating today who says that great causes are not won by doubtful men and women. 
And it is inspirational leadership. It is progressive leadership. It is foundational leadership that put us in a position to put our name forward, to campaign, and to win convincingly among all the countries in the world that seat to the Security Council. And I'll come back to that. Reparatory justice. I see people talking now that the royals are coming to visit the region. In other countries, I hear people talking reparations now like it's a new talk. But it was our prime minister who got CARICOM to start a reparatory justice commission that produced, got the lawyers to advise us, who wrote books in his own time on reparatory justice in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and in the wider Caribbean. Advancing constitutional awareness and constitutional reform. Advancing the conversation, we lost that battle. People who said it was a good constitution decided instead to vote along party lines and in, instead of national lines and admitted such. And that's unfortunate. But it is passing strange, as the Minister of Urban Development said, to hear some people congratulating other countries for doing what we tried to do all the way back in 2009, that they opposed. Even things that were not fully successful, like the constitutional reform movement. We congratulate him because it was a bold act. And not every time you will succeed, but you learn your lessons and you know that you're on the right side of history. Yeah. The people who cussed him for years when he was trying to keep Liat in the air, now balling that there's no Liat in the air. Same people. Principled opposition to the sale of our citizenship in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you and congratulations. Because we're living long enough to see all of the things that he predicted come to pass. We see legislation brought now by American politicians aligning themselves with the European Parliament, saying that the citizenship by investment thing has gone too far and we have to cut it down. He said that was coming. I remember him saying that was coming, separate and apart from the principal position on what citizenship is and what it means to a nation and what it means to be a nation. He said this thing is also not sustainable. And in saying that, the entire armada of anti-progressive forces outside of this region, whose only interest was to sell our passport, mobilized against this country and that man, Ralph Gonzalez. They bragged about how, I'm talking about SCL now, they bragged about how they could make his name appear in Google searches with scurrilous accusations. The opposition was a member of the board of the SCL, you know. I remember in 2010, when the Honorable Prime Minister took to the airways before the election and said the SCL was spending four and a half million US dollars to win the election here. And the New Democratic Party said, boy, if we had four and a half million dollars, then you would have seen election because that's not true. Blatant falsehood. But now I read the Guardian newspaper in England and I read the organized crime and corruption reporting project. And both of them say that internal documents of the SCL said they spent four and a half million US dollars on that election. I'm not calling anybody in the NDP a liar because they probably didn't even know what SCL was spending to oust Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez. But I know from those accounts that they had outsourced their electoral policy and they had outsourced their developmental policy to the SCL because it's those same SCL people were saying, tell them you go bring a hotel, tell them you go bring this, tell them you go bring that. And then they just read it. Imagine where we would have been now. 
congratulations. I know we would not have had the housing revolution, but for the presence of the Prime Minister, because the other side opposed it. I know we would not have had the education revolution, because that was opposed. I know we would not have the Argyle International Airport, because they opposed it. It's the wrong angle. You need wind shifter, where the money go come from, all the rest of it. I know you wouldn't have the modern medical diagnostic center in Georgetown, because they say Sufri go blow it away. Well, Sufri blow, and it's still there. I know you would not have the YES program because they used to call it the Youth Exploitation Service. I know we wouldn't have our presence on the Security Council because when I was in New York at the United Nations, I listened to people in this honorable house today speaking on the radio saying there's no way that we could get on the Security Council. It's a political gimmick. They even said that China would veto it. Such was their misunderstanding of how the Security Council worked. And when I wrote something from New York and put in the paper, then they went on the radio day after to say I was out of place to try to correct them from uttering those falsehoods. So I know we wouldn't have been there. I know we wouldn't have a relationship with Taiwan because they've explicitly said they would go to China. I know we wouldn't have an anti-austerity economic policy because, like I said, they had austerity in the manifesto as a goal, as an objective. And I know we would not have had the leadership of arguably the greatest prime minister in the Caribbean, Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez. While the member for Central Kingstown Madam Speaker was, was um, talking about the glory years, glory days of his party and their apparent perfection. I was over here online on my iPad looking up all the countries in CARICOM since their date of independence till now to see which leaders of an independent Caribbean country have been in office for as long as our Prime Minister. I'll start in the double digits and come up. Dean Barrow of Belize is the longest serving in Belize, 12 years. Verbord in Antigua and Barbuda, 12 years. He did some time pre-independence as well, but they're talking about independence going forward. Owen Arta in Barbados did 13 years. John Compton in, of blessed memory. Owen Arta is also of blessed memory. Well, so is Vaybord. So please assume my blessed memory when I speak of these titans. So John Compton did 13 years consecutively. Then he came back for about a year thereafter. Keith Mitchell in Grenada did 13 consecutive years, then took a break, five years. That's what he says, those are his words, that he took a break, and then came back in 2013. So he has done 22 years, but he didn't do it unbroken. P.J. Patterson in Jamaica, 14 years. Roosevelt Skerritt in Dominica, 17 years. His party has been in power longer than the ULP, but there were other prime ministers before Roosevelt Skerritt during that stretch. And Roosevelt is still a very young and popular man, so this list might become a different list in the future, but I'm talking as of now. Roosevelt Skerritt, 17 years. I like to call him young, come here, he's the same age. <laughs> then you come to Lyndon Pindling in the Bahamas, 19 years. Denzel Douglas Forbes Barnum, Eric Williams, 19 years. And that's the list. And above all of them, in terms of tenure, 
Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez, 21 years and counting. That's why we're saying congratulations here today, you know, Madam Speaker, not to get in some back and forth about ULP versus NDP, and we had good years and you had good years. An anniversary is coming up. 21 years is significant. Five consecutive electoral victories is significant. Madam Speaker, from the list I read out, it will tell you that 21 years in office is a major feat of Vincentian history and a major feat of Caribbean history. And we congratulate him for achieving that milestone. Madam Speaker, and there are little things. 21 years as leader, not a single member, not a single elected member of parliament ever resign, ever quit party led by Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez since it came into office. We have other history in the Caribbean in this own country where one day a man in a party, the next day he left, the third day he running against you as an independent or as somebody else. But it is testament to the camaraderie and unity. Put the unity in Unity Labour Party. That in 21 years, hard times, bad times, good times, sad times, he kept the team together. In fact, most of our former reps are still actively involved in the party and they're, they're functioning. And that says something about the leadership of the man who brought them together, built the camaraderie, helped to instill the love for one another and love for country that keep these individuals serving even when their parliamentary career has ended. We had two cycles of eight, seven, one seat majority. People used to say, how are you managing? How are you governing so easy, so boldly? We say, with our leader. One seat majority, 10 seat majority. He will govern in the same way because he's interested in the people and he has work to do. Madam Speaker, I want to congratulate him, finally by repeating three of his most oft-repeated quotes. And the way that he has drummed them into our consciousness. The way that one of his legacies now, now and forever, is the expectation that he has created among the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that a government must be people-centered, that a government must work for the people and not vice versa. And that the government must be your partner, the state must be your partner in development and growth. Sometimes when I hear people coming around to the position of the prime minister, I say that's a good thing. Because no more will it be right wing and left wing and backward and progressive. Everybody will come around to the position that the Prime Minister has been enunciating of people-centered governance, of the value of education, of lifting poverty, of holding your head up high as a Vincentian. He talks about building, and we know them all, a strong, competitive, many-sided, post-colonial economy. That is a legacy of the man that we congratulate him today. He talks about letting you would fly like eagles with their wings unclipped. And that is a legacy of the Prime Minister. And he says, we are not better than anybody, but nobody is better than Vincentia. So we congratulate him today to say that nobody is better than Vincentians. But politically, and for the past 21 years and counting, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez has been better by far. And for those reasons, I want to congratulate Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez on achieving an unbroken stint 
of 21 years as the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, to my very quick research, I believe it is the longest such unbroken stint by any leader in an independent Caribbean country. I'm obliged. I recognize the Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise to offer my congratulations to three organizations, themselves institutions in our Vincentian society today. Madam Speaker, I thought that by now I would have been answering questions. <laughs> But <laughs> I realize, however, that what we have here today is an opportunity for us to offer congratulations where they are due. And I want to put into context the reasons for offering congratulations to these organizations. I want to start with the Unity Labor Party for its achievement of 21 years in governance in this country. It's the 24th anniversary. And I want to start at our colonial experience. Because if you don't do this, you don't really appreciate how far we have come and the role that the Unity Labor Party administrations would have played in taking us this far. Our colonial experience, as I repeat all the time, has left us with significant deficits in almost every aspect of our lives. In health, in housing, in infrastructure, in politics, and of course, in education. And Madam Speaker, so that I would not be long, I would focus a lot on education. But, but I want to show how since independence, the various administrations, whether they were led by the late Robert Milton Cato, Honorable, or the late Honorable Sir James Mitchell, that the focus always was on reducing these deficits that we inherited from colonial, from our colonial experience. Yet, Despite their efforts, on the eve of 2000, I would say at the beginning of the 24th century, despite all these efforts, let me remind persons where we were so that you would understand where we are today and appreciate the work that would have been done. If we look at our schooling, our young children that we refer today to as the early learners, those of preschool age, 
the vast majority of them were not exposed to any preschool. When we look at our primary education, the teachers in that segment of our education system generally while they were trained at the level of the well let me put it this way while they were trained professionally content wise there's not a lot of great training in other words we didn't have persons moving on to the stage of completing their degree programs within the primary system. And in fact, if you happen to have gone to the university as a primary school teacher, you could not remain in the primary school because there were no positions there for graduates. You have to move on to the secondary school. And in fact, when we look at secondary education, only four out of every ten students were able to move on to secondary education. And more than that, as we are talking about trained teachers, at the level of the secondary school, the situation was even more grave because you did not have a lot of persons at the secondary schools with the requisite content to teach the respective disciplines. In fact, at our two so-called elite schools, you had a situation where provisions were made to allow for 18 graduate teachers at each of those schools. Whereas in the rural schools, only three graduates were allowed at these schools. I want to go further and say, in this country, at the turn of the 21st century, we still had schools with pit latrines. More than that, I want to go back. Those of us who had the opportunity to go to university, even though our economic costs were paid, we had to be bought in with taking loans to ensure that we can pay our way through university. And many of us had the embarrassing moments where when we turn up to register for the particular year, we were denied. Why? Because our government did not contribute to paying our economic costs. I heard a lot of things being said about economic costs. But the truth is, at the turn of the 21st century, we were not paying our contribution, therefore impacting on persons accessing their education. I want to make the point also that at the turn of the 21st century, the emphasis of the education program was still on reform. Reform to allow for greater access to education. Early childhood, we had good coverage at primary. We had to be campaigning for reform so that we could have greater access to secondary education, greater access to post-secondary education. And many persons recall that still at the turn of the 21st century, 
we were still not offering a large number of our graduates, even though that number was already small, the opportunity to pursue post-secondary education, what we call advanced level education. Not many persons would also recall that we had challenges in terms of relevance and where subjects like technical and vocational training and edu well, education and training, there was generally a lack of opportunities for persons to pursue such training. Honorable member, yes? I want to remind you that we're on the congratulatory remarks. Oh, I, yes. I think I see where you're going, but if we can get there a little okay. bit more quickly. Okay, fair enough. Now, so I'm making this point, Madam Speaker, to show that despite the efforts of those governments before, at the turn of the 21st century, when the ULP came into office, there were still many, many challenges that this administration or this party had to deal with. Challenges, as I mentioned in summary, the access, the equity, relevance, and even quality of our education. And today, while the work has not yet been completed, we can say that we have seen from since 2001 a series of initiatives in education that has had a revolutionary impact on our education system. We have seen the transformation in our education here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And that is something that we must congratulate the ULP for. And I want to make it more personal. We heard congratulations to the leader. But the leader had to be supported and had his support staff. And I want to focus and those who worked in the education sector to ensure that they laid the foundation for this revolution and consolidate so that today I could add my own contribution to taking it to the next level. I want to congratulate the Honorable Michael Ebron, who was also a former representative of West St. George. Another colleague and my NYC brother, the Honorable Clayton E. Morgan, sorry, Clayton Morgan. <laughs> because they were the two persons who were in charge of setting the foundation for what eventually emerged as an education revolution. I want also to congratulate Miss the Honorable Garland Miguel for her contribution. In fact, I would say while the Honorable Mike Brown and the Honorable Clayton Borgen set the foundation by the first set of years into the second decade of the 21st century. We were seeing a paradigm shift in education because significant progress would have been made on the issues of access and equity, and allow, therefore, for greater emphasis being placed on relevance, relevance of our education system. Because by then, 
it was recognized, as was said, that here, at this stage, the country needed to move to the next stage, that of establishing an economy that was post-colonial, and therefore, yes? I mean, it's, it might sound a trivia, but this is the Minister of, Ad of Education, and there are lots of young people listening. If the minister said, is saying that something was done, why is he saying it would have been done? And he keeps doing it's, it. I'm hearing it several points in his speech. If something would have been done, it means it hasn't been done yet. So it's a basic grammatical thing, but it's commonplace now. But as minister of education, I think it's imperative that he sets the tone and try to use proper English language. Okay. It's really great into the now. Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm I'm not going to respond. Yes, it won't it won't push me or uh, 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 derail me away from what I have to say. Yes, but so I was making the point. Yes. Yes. I was making the point that in fact when in the second, or uh, all years of the second decade, it was recognized that, look, we had to transform our economy. And we had to move to that next stage. The Honorable Yolin Miguel played a significant role in that paradigm shift. Then, we had taken over the mantle from the Honorable Gurley Miguel, my friend and brother, also from NYC days, the Honorable member from Marocco, Sinclair Jimmy Prince, as well as Teacher Debbie. And they brought it to this level where now I have to take it to the other level. So I want to congratulate these persons for their significant role that they have played in ensuring that this country address in a serious manner the challenges, the deficits, that we inherited in the beginning of the 24th century. And secondly, I want to offer my congratulations to the Tromaca Ontario Secondary School for once again taking the lead in organizing what was a tremendous sporting event. That is the All Leeward Sporting Competition. And this is significant and that is why I'm giving it this sort of attention. Because that event was organized this year, after an absence of about two years, I think. But when it was organized, it did not only provide an opportunity for the persons in the North Leeward area to showcase, well, sorry, the entire Leeward area to showcase their talents. But it was an inspiration to the rest of the country, especially the other schools, because it was saying that despite all the challenges that we have with the COVID-19 pandemic, this is possible. And not only that, 
the, the support from the general community was such that this event served to inspire others. So I want to congratulate the Chumaka Ontario Secondary School for organizing this event. And I want also to congratulate those schools that participated in that event. And, and they didn't just have all the were schools, that is to say, schools from, um, I mean, the Bethel um, Secondary, the Buckerman Secondary, Central Leeward Secondary, um, and, and Petty Bodell Secondary. But they also had two schools from outside of the area who they invited as guests. The Girls High School and the Thomas Under Secondary School. Madam Speaker, and yes, I want also to congratulate the sponsors who, who put their monies into that activity. Madam Speaker, finally, I want to congratulate Sister Jacinta Wallace and her newly elected executive members to the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Association of Secondary Schools principals as well as the principals of the Tivet institutions. This organization is a critical one to the continued advancement of our education. And it has been a little dormant for a couple years now. But I want to congratulate that association and more so to congratulate the newly elected executive and pledge my support to ensure that it function effectively and they continue to do the work to advance our education here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Much obliged, Madam Speaker. I'm going to ask if you can give way, and I, as I've recognized, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I know <clears throat> that the hour is late, but Madam Speaker, I too wish to rise to congratulate two sets of people. First, as I did recently, in another context, I congratulate the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and in particular, those supporters of the New Democratic Party for their continued wisdom in seeing the great works and potential of this political party and for continuing to supporting it. Most recently in its successful convention and 
Of course, in the, the recent general elections, by the majority vote given to the New Democratic Party. And then, of course, Madam Speaker, I will give an individual congratulation to a person whom I'll mention a little later. Madam Speaker, I was sitting here, and it crossed my mind that this extended period of congratulations, unprecedented, quite frankly, in the history of this parliament since I've been here, that I would have it strains credulity to think that, Madam Speaker, we didn't have some notice of it, that they may have mentioned that they were going to do this. Just curious, because this is truly one of a kind. Because I do recall when some time ago, well, I'll get into that later. But let me come back, Madam Speaker, to talk about what essentially is being done here. My member, Minister of uh, Finance said, self-praise is no recommendation. But in fact, that is what they sought to do. And maybe they believe what they were saying. I assume they believe what they were saying. But the real question is whether the people out there have that same vision or benign view of the many years that this government, the ULP, have been in office. We talk about time as though it is a positive value in itself. Time only matters if you use it wisely. Whether it's 20 years or 10 years, there are people who are going to accomplish in the United States, presidential administrations are limited to eight years because they have, through their own reasoning, found that that is effective time for you to govern and to get what you need done. In many countries where political leaders or parties are in office, political leaders move aside and other new persons come in place because they recognize that you need to have new people, even within the same organization, to bring new energy to the process. But we have seen here, they talk about longevity, and 21 years as if by itself, it is worthy of congratulations. If you use 21 years wisely, and the lives of the people are improved, then you applaud yourself. If you take 20 years or 10 years or 30 years, Robert Mugabe was in office for 27 years. He was a revolutionary, a man that people not just on the continent of Africa look forward to. But no one would say that the time, the 27 years he spent in office, or possibly more, was time well spent. So let's get away from this notion about how much time you've been and who's been here longer than you and measuring yardstick. That's what children do in the schoolyard. What matters, Madam Speaker, is what you do with the time that you have. And from what position you're in, how much you have dedicated your life to serving the people. And I must tell you, I am very proud to be the leader of the New Democratic Party. And I'm very thankful to the people who supported me as leader and who recently re-elected me as political leader unopposed. And we look forward to doing great things for the people of this country, Madam Speaker. So I want those people to understand that their confidence is one that I feel deserves that recognition here in this honorable house. And that the record that we have as a political party from 1984 to 2001, and I challenge anyone 
to check that record of accomplishment and to see the level of transformation that took place in this country between those years, 20, 1984 and 2001, that's 17 and a half years of NDP government. And that is unmatched anywhere in the recent history of this country. We talk about the community college under this administration that they expanded it. Well, NDP built it. We talk about the expansion of the airport at Kanawanui Village Jet Airport. That is like saying you have a house that has three bedroom and you add one in it, and you built a four bedroom house. You didn't, you add one room to it. And that is what they have been doing consistently. All of the visionary things that have been done. You add something to it, you rename it, and you say that they created. I think this is what the member for Central King Song mentioned when he talked about the Columbus. Is it principle you said? Like they rediscover everything by simply putting a new label on it. It is true political parties. You come, you find what is in place as the great New Democratic Party under Sir James Mitchell and then Arnhem Eustace did from 1984 to 2001 and progress was made. You know that students in the secondary schools, that the number of students going to secondary schools expanded dramatically. That scholarships available from the time 1984 to the time they left office in 2001 one, were greatly expanded. More have been brought on, but that is a an incremental and progressive change. They didn't create it. The point that I'm making, Madam Speaker, is before we get into this mode of basically presenting as though everything that was done in this country was accomplished in the last 21 years, we have to take a very close look at the record. The members on the other side, Madam Speaker, they talk about all the great accomplishments. The infrastructure work that was done. The investments that were done here. The vision that was shown here. Whatever labels you put on things. The fundamental fact is, and this is what we must always recognize with the NDP. The fundamental fact is, how did it change the lives of the people in this country? And we know from their own records that between 2008 and 2018, the rate of poverty went up in this country. How do you get away from that, Madam Speaker, with all of your accomplishments? How do you square that with the fact that the lives of the people were made more miserable? Never mind all of the accomplishments that you brag about. Whereas, Madam Speaker, during the time of James Mitchell and the NDP, you had a property-owning class developing in this country where people were empowered to change their own circumstances, not to depend on the government going over and bringing back a handout for you, to improve their own circumstances and the level of poverty went down in this country. How do you square the fact, Madam Speaker, with all the wonderful things that they've been congratulating themselves about? That in 2018, in its Article 4, 4, <clears throat> Article 4 Consultant Report, the IMF said that unemployment in St. Vincent and the Grenadines between 2001 and 2018, the rate of unemployment had gone up. There were more unemployed people in the country then as a percentage of the population than there were in 2001. Honorable, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, as I have done for other members. And I, I indeed agree with you that this is most unprecedented. And out of unprecedented events, we evolve. I'll speak more about that privately. But I just want to remind you that we're under congratulatory Thank remarks. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And as I've done for other members, I remind you as to content yes. and time. Well, let, me, let me just, Madam Speaker, you. Thank you very much. Let me congratulate the New Democratic Party, Madam Speaker for its accomplishment and its record of investing in people and recognizing that development is not about individuals, individual projects, but rather it's, it's not about 
the scale and the size of a project, but for recognizing it's about how it impacts and change people's lives. And let me congratulate the vision that Sir James had, Madam Speaker, and continued by Adam Youssef, to say that you invest in people and give them the means, whether it's in land or in business opportunities. If somebody, for example, was going to start up a little export business where they were going to sell conch and lobster abroad, you don't bring somebody from abroad to compete with them. You give them a chance to be able to succeed. These are some of the things, Madam Speaker, that you have to get right in order for our people to be able to develop. And when they talk about, Madam Speaker, you know, when in the New Democratic Party, we talk about growth and development. It's about growth and development of the people. And this is what we saw in the many years of successful governance that took place under James Mitchell and Adam Eustace. And what we have promised, Madam Speaker, in the last general elections, and for which vision I want to congratulate the people of this country again, especially supporters of the NDP, for which vision they accepted because a majority of the people voted for the New Democratic Party. Fundamentally, that is what democracy is about. Constitutionally, you may form government, but fundamentally, democracy is about the majority will of the people prevailing. When that doesn't exist, Madam Speaker, every effort ought to be made to rectify it, and that is what we are about. Madam Speaker, I want to just, by way of comparison, to what I heard from some members on the other side regarding how governments proceed, and to show why the New Democratic Party is worthy of the congratulations that are being given here, and the members in their recognition of their support, and their support for the party are worthy of that, Madam Speaker. Because here, they spoke about empirical facts about what was happening, what have been accomplished in the country. I heard a member from the other side, I think it was the Minister for, of Finance, he said they would not have had the airport, they would not have had this, they would not have had that if the NDP had been in office. Well, I'll tell you some things we would not have had, Madam Speaker, because we didn't have it. We would not, if Ralph was not the Prime Minister, fine. Well, the well, same thing. If the Prime Minister was, so meaning that if any of you, any one of you were Prime Minister, it would it, it would not matter. All right, well let's go. If yes, if 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 the, the if if Ralph were not the Prime Minister, you would not have had all these things. Well, here is what you would not have had rising unemploy, uh, unemployment. Honor, honorable, just a minute, Honorable Minister of Urban Development, just a minute, Honorable. Madam Speaker, No, I no, 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 just oh, a sorry. minute. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Yes, Madam Speaker. I would have reminded you just moments ago about the content. And I was so happy for the interjection of the member for Central Kingstown to put that into context for us. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to confine your remarks within the context of the agenda item as listed on the order paper, which are congratulatory remarks. The, the, the standing orders and the rules and the general thrust of parliamentary procedure prohibit using these types of agenda items for debating purposes. I think it is most fully expressed in the um, content of questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes? Thank you, Madam I, I'm not sure if, I'm, I'm, I'm not, to, not to stop you, but I think that I'm not sure why the Honorable Minister of Urban Development is standing. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, just to... I beg your pardon. Just to... Yeah, he's standing. I'm, I'm listening to him. Just to correct the Honorable Leader of the Opposition with a statement he made earlier on, said that the New Democratic Party was in government for 17 and a half years. It's not correct. The New Democratic Party was in government for 16 and a half years 
and two months. So I just want to make it pretty accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, if you could continue with your congratulatory remarks. Well, Madam Speaker, why do we take that as his correction? All it proves is that the time, what, what, what matters is how you use the time. Because in the time, whatever the time was, that the NDP was in office that he wants to say, they have accomplished so much that now, Madam Speaker, we hear all the waxing lyrical here. When you go on the streets of Kingston, you go in the villages around this country, you talk in my own constituency, you go to, 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 to Union Island, you hear the people are talking about what it was like and how much they had accomplished, how much better off they were, Madam Speaker. And this is why, on the New Democratic Party, and this is why, Madam Speaker, they have continued to support this party in its efforts to retain government so that we could continue on the march to progress for this country. And we support, congratulate, and thank them for that, Madam Speaker. Now, I know that we are all very um, concerned and very uh, careful about the rules here, Madam Speaker, about the content and the form and the length of time and so forth. Now, with all due respect, much of the license that has been given here today, Madam Speaker, has resulted in us having to respond to set the record straight in this honorable house. You cannot have a situation where one side, Madam Speaker, stands up and use a procedure which we acknowledge has never been used for this purpose like that before and now to simply seek to hamstring us in responding. I'll tell you though, and I will conclude soon, the important point that we need to understand, and why, Madam Speaker, I believe that in the service of the people, whether you are in opposition and you are in government, and this is where I am so grateful and respectful of the people who support us, is that you do of your very best and you serve people to your very best. Whether times are good or times are not. As my friend, the member for Central King Song likes to call him the wilderness years. Well, to quote Martin Luther King, he said that the ultimate measure of the man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. You might know that quote well, Madam Speaker. But where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. We have been, Madam Speaker, in this great political party, and this is where I think a nation recognizes the commitment and the sincerity of the members on this side of the House. Whether it's for 20 years or 21 years, we continue to serve the people to the very best of our ability. When others would have cut and run and gone somewhere else, you know, we have start, stayed here serving the people for the best of our ability, and we will continue to do so. And our objective and our regret on behalf of the people is that, Madam Speaker, those years, so much more could have been accomplished on behalf of the people of this country. And I want to give that pledge and promise to the people that the time isn't far off when that support and that commitment will be rewarded, Madam Speaker, by an NDP government then working on behalf of the people rather than on behalf of a few individuals who are well-placed and well-connected. That is what we need to have in this country. And I have no regret whatsoever in my service to my party, and I thank them so much for it. And I have no regret about my service to my people, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I thank them for it. And Madam Speaker, I know that there are better things to come, and soon there will be. And I want to congratulate again my team of persons who have been 
elected through our vibrant democratic process in our party to serve the people of this country. And we continue to attract new talent always to renew and to serve the people. And we will go forward, Madam Speaker, in that spirit of service and always recognizing that the people of this country come first. And what matters is the accomplishment in office, not how long in office. And we will make it count. I always say, give me 10 years and I'll transform this country. Amen. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, I wish to I wish to extend happy congratulations to a constituent of mine, and this is again in keeping with our commitment always to remember people and to look out for people. Her name was or is Helen Vesterbonian. She celebrated a hundred years. On the 5th of March, and she still have all her marbles, even though she's a little slower than usual. But she was a great, one of the early female cricketers in this country. She loved playing cricket. She loved playing sport. And so we had a, there was a few, there, there, a few, there was a, a celebration for her. Her birthday was held at the Anglican Church. <laughs> I've been to too many recently. Um, they, 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 she, she, she celebrated her birthday, and there was a wonderful church service for her on Saturday the 5th, which I had the pleasure of attending, and I just want to wish her uh, Godspeed and continued blessings, because she seemed to have everything there. Well done, Vesta Bunyan. And with that, Madam Speaker, I think we probably will be going for lunch. Thank you. Just a moment, honorable members. I have to also ensure that the record is set straight on certain matters. And we must always remember to keep it very tight and very clear. I agree, as I think, that all members here agree that today's congratulatory remarks have been unprecedented. But I don't think that this is a precedent that we wish to continue with at all. And I think that is the consensus of both sides. Having said that, it is not in my usual style to have these matters ventilated in public. And at another moment, I would speak on this accordingly. Yes. And I know that you would support me, Honorable Member for Central Kingston, because when I assume this office, you were among the first to let me know that where matters of congratulatory remarks and obituaries are concerned, it is the practice established that members are to indicate beforehand if they wish to speak. I will not point fingers, but let us just say I had no indication from some members. You didn't catch me. Just a moment, honorable member, just a moment. Just a moment. I'm not pointing fingers on either side. Neither for obituaries nor con congratulatory remarks. In some, in some instances, I did. The time perhaps has also come for us to look at time limits as it relates to these matters. And again, we will speak privately because it is not in my nature, style, or otherwise to raise private matters in a public forum. That's not how we do it. That's not how I want it done. Having said that, however, the debate has gone as it has gone, or the proceedings have gone as they have gone. Long past out the gate, we can now only try to correct it. But it is unfair and inaccurate to say that one side has been allowed to speak and the other side has not. There have been instances on both sides where both sides have raised points of order as one is entitled so to do if there is any misrepresentation or any flouting of the rules. So I just wanted to set that abundantly straight and to put members on notice 
that we will be addressing privately how we continue in the future as it pertains to obituaries and congratulatory remarks so that the business of the parliament can be conducted. A very significant part of the business of the parliament is the questions for oral answers. We haven't yet gotten there. Thankfully, not only did I make history as the first female speaker, but I made history as sitting until 3 a.m. And I'm happy to do that again because I, I, I am ready. So let us get on with it. I'm happy with that. <laughs> I might get bipartisan. <laughs> but having said all of that, mem uh, members, we have to continue, and I will recognize the Honorable Minister of Social Welfare. I'm so sorry, Public Service. And I trust, given his experience, he will know how to proceed accordingly. Madam, Madam Speaker, thank you very much, Honorable Members. I rise this afternoon to offer congratulations to the Unity Labour Party and the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonsalves Excuse me, Madam Speaker. Um, if I can be permitted to ask a question through you, Madam Speaker, if the Honorable Minister, it's a question of clarification. I, I don't understand, Honorable Member. Well, I was on my feet before he started, but you didn't see me. Well, well if, if I point your direction to the rules, whomsoever my eye catches first, that's yeah, no, I am not, nice to speak. I am not asking for permission to make a presentation. I'd yes. like to ask a question with regards to the protocols. The protocols which were distributed You're asking a question of to, me. You, to you, Madam oh, Speaker. Yes, very well. The protocols indicate that this chamber, these chambers would be sanitized every four hours. Or as is practical. So and, we we've been, and we've been here for over five hours. Beautiful point. So. Yes. So it means, thank you for that interjection. It means that we are all getting ready to have the chamber sanitized and also to have a break from the mass as soon as I finish congratulatory remarks. Honorable Minister of the Public Service. Thank you very much. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to offer congratulatory remarks to the Unity Labour Party and to Dr. the Honorable Ralphie Gonsalves Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on this significant milestone achievement, 21 years of good governance in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, we are here today because of the visionary leadership of persons who have, are still here not only in the parliament, but still on the land of the living and because of some who have gone on to the great beyond. We must recognize the contributions, Madam Speaker, of the late Sir Vincent Ian Beach, who, along with Dr. Gonsalves and Sir Louis Straker, among Sister Girl in Miguel, who are the pioneers and who started. And uh, we also have to congratulate Julian Francis, the Honorable Julian Francis too, for his years as General Secretary of the Unity Labour Party and, and saw us through these victories. Madam Speaker, there are many achievements of this Unity Labour Party government. I believe it was in 2004, 2005, Madam Speaker, that you were sitting on this side of the House as a member of the Parliament, and you piloted the motion on the education revolution. I remember listening to the, the Parliament 
the debates going on on this motion and the members on the opposition side of this parliament did not support the education revolution. And Madam Speaker, we have to congratulate you also for being once a member of the Unity Labour Party that today we have the education revolution flowing and deepening here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, we, as I said before, there are many, many things that we have to congratulate, many achievements and many milestones. And I sat here this, this afternoon and listened to the leader of the, the opposition saying how they had good governance in those days and so on. And I want to reiterate the point that was made by Minister of Finance that in all the 21 years of this Unity Labour Party government, not one single member of the government ever resigned for one purpose or the other or on reason or the other. But I want to remind the, the opposition that in their years, several of their members had to resign or had to resign themselves for matters of national interest. Madam Speaker, we're congratulating good governance. That's, that's the point. Madam Speaker, we have to remember also names like Conrad Sayers and Sister Rennie and, and, and Clayton Bergen, Selman Walters, Mike Brown, Clayton Bergen, as I mentioned, sorry, Gerald Thompson, Glenn Beach, who are participants in this house during these 21 years, Madam Speaker. Their contributions have gone a long way and made this Unity Labour Party the party of choice for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, I'd leave those congratulations there, but I just want to move into some congratulations in relation to sports here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, in the recent trials for Carifta 2022 at the athletics track, the St. Vincent Beach Athletics track at Diamond, I want to say to us here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, those who are listening, that we have had some outstanding achievements there. Madam Speaker, Shante Matthias, on the 17, 100 meters and 200 meters from the girls' high school and the IDAT club. Keo Davis, a male on the 17, 100 meters, 200 meters, 4 by 400 meters of the St. Vincent Grammar School, the same club. Cody Grant, male on the 17 in the long jump, the high jump, and the 4 by 400 meters, Thomas Sanders secondary exceed. Jaheem Harry, on the, nine, on the 17, 400 meters and 4 by 400 meters, the Central Leeward Secondary School, the club high performance. Zachary Sober on the 17, 100 meters, 200 meters, 4 by 400 meters of the same school. Ajay Delplesh on the 17, 400 meters, 4 by 400 meters, the Pitti Bodel Secondary School. Granisha Thomas on the 20, 400 meters, 200 meters, St. Vincent Grammar School, Gail and John, Hepleton, the Central Leeward Secondary School, Kyle Lawrence of the St. Vincent Grenadines Community College, Devon Rick Mack of the Central Leeward Secondary School in the 100 meters, Kirk Hamlet, Octolon, Central Leeward Secondary, 
Amal Glasgow, he's, he's presently in Jamaica. Verrill Sam, who's also in Jamaica in high jump and, and Glasgow in the 400 meters. Neil Amberton, 1,500 meters, 800 meters, four by 400 meters. He's also in Jamaica. And Uroy Ryan in the high jump, the long jump, and the four by 400 meters, also in Jamaica. They are members of the Carifta team for St. Vincent and the Grenadines 20. 22. Madam Speaker, I also want to congratulate Handel Robin, who will join the seniors from this year, and he continues to do well. He is, was part of the record-breaking 4 by 800 meter relay team for his school, the Jamaica College. You are Ryan also in the Jamaica College, is a top jumper for his school. He recently jumped over seven meters in the long jump, and he has also qualified for Carifta, as I mentioned earlier. Madam Speaker, several of our young athletes continue to perform well at home and overseas, and they will do very well for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Madam Speaker, in relation to, to the inter-school, secondary, and primary school sporting activities, the inter-primary school heats are presently ongoing from the 22nd to the 25th of March, and their finals will be on the 7th of April. The secondary schools heats would be on the 30th and 31st of March, and their finals would be on the 8th of April. And all of these activities, sporting events, would be taking place at the athletics, Sir Vincent Beach Athletics Track at Diamond in the constituency of South Windward. Camelo. Madam Speaker, in relation to cricket, <laughs> in relation to cricket, the Ford VPL Championship is presently being played at the Arnesville playing field. This year's tournament sees six male teams and two female teams taking part in that championship. The matches are going on, maybe all now, the second game. In terms of football, Madam Speaker, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines women team will play the British Virgin Islands women team at Annas Vale, playing field on the 6th of April, 2022. In terms of netball, and this one is very interesting, Madam Speaker, the American Netball Men's Championship is scheduled to take place here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines from the 31st August to the 5th of September 2022. Madam Speaker, several countries, the American Netball is an, an affiliate of the World Netball Association, and they have asked St. Vincent and the Grenadines to host this tournament. Um, and we, we <laughs> well, we're getting there. We're getting there, my brother. And the teams will be participating from the countries following the, the following countries: and Argentina, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, Trinidad and Tobago, Saint Kitts and Nevis, Grenada, Canada, the USA, and host country Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. And finally, Madam Speaker, I want to congratulate. I didn't, don't think I did it the last parliament, or it wasn't played. I, the, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines national netball team, the female netball team, on recently winning the OECS ECCB International Netball Series held in Dominica. Madam Speaker, with these few remarks, 
I, I want to extend congratulations to everyone. I'm much obliged. Thank you. Yes. Honorable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Honorable Members. I wish to join my colleagues in congratulating the Unity Labour Party in celebrating 21 years in office. My colleagues have covered a lot of ground in reflecting on how we have used the 21 years. I think I will be correct in saying that they have indicated that we did use those 21 years very well. Madam Speaker, a 21st anniversary under any circumstance is worthy of celebration, is worthy of congratulations. It is a milestone that suggests durability and strength, both of which the ULP has demonstrated over the past two decades. It is an achievement which is unprecedented in our country, and we ought to be proud of it. Right. Of course, there are naysayers, but I'm satisfied that that 21 years came maybe a little bit too late, but it was very opportune, and this country, the people of this country, have benefited tremendously as a result. And that is why I wish to congratulate this political party and this government, and also the leadership of the party, especially the Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. And I wish to add the anchor in the position of General Secretary, Mr. Julian Francis. This historic feat, Madam Speaker, tells a story not just of longevity, but equally of service to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We are congratulating today a people-centered government and party which responded positively to the needs of the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And there is ample evidence throughout this country to indicate that that is so. I make bold to say, Madam Speaker, that no other entity in the history of this country has done so much with so little in such a short time towards social transformation in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am serious about that. The Unity Labour Party deserves the applause it is getting from all right-thinking persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I proudly join in that applause. We are congratulating today a party which transformed a small, sleepy, laid-back archipelago into a modern, forward-looking country respected all over the world. And everybody is proud to say that there are intentions now. Just, just a moment, Honorable Minister of Health, Honorable Member for Senate. Madam Speaker, I don't know how much longer my honorable colleague on the other side is going to do his presentation. But the households are very clear that members must not read their presentation. They may refer to their notes. And I, I get the sense from an experienced presenter, the honorable member is in fact reading from prepared notes rather than referring to bullet points to make his presentation. And he has sufficient experience to do better. I know that. But, Madam Speaker, if you look at my paper, it's a set of jottings all over it. But maybe uh, my song as if I'm reading. I'm sorry. I mean, I. Look, 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 you want to see it? No, I don't want to see it. <laughs> but um, there is also 
a little rule that says that we ought not to have debated the, um, this particular section. And we did. There's, However, also, there's also another thing, Honorable Minister, not to take this any longer than it needs to be. But the particular rule to which you referred touches and concerns um, debate. Just, 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 just as we all learn together, and so, we see a new dispensation. So, so Madam Speaker, <laughs> even, if, even if I were reading, even if I were reading, I would not have transgressed. <laughs> I, I'm just, I just want to make the point that even if I were reading, and I'm not reading, you concede, all right, that I would not have transgressed. If I did transgress, I would have stopped. Okay, good. We congratulating today, party, which transformed, I said just now, a sleepy, backwater, if you like, country from 2001 into a forward-looking one. No. I am satisfied that that is so. A sleepy archipelago called St. Vincent and the Grandines that some persons consider to be a backwater country. Backwater. You know what's backwater? People consider it to be backwater. No, not me. Not me at all. Come on. Come on, um, honorable member. Please Central, please. For Central Kingston. Please you know, continue. You know, you know me better than that. <laughs> 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 Madam Speaker. Speaker, over the past 21 years, we were not spared disasters. As a matter of fact, this government, this party took power, or took office, if you prefer, at a time when the banana industry was waning, and then it met its demise through the fault of ours. Apart from that, we had droughts, and we had hurricanes, and we had floods, and even in the special period, the special period, we had a pandemic, an eruption of last fray. And we came through, we came through that 21 years stronger. We managed to maintain a high level of stability and progress because we maintained stable, disciplined govern governance and government. And this stability, Madam Speaker, I make bold to say, helped us in attracting foreign direct investment. Although I know there are some people who have problems with foreign direct investment. I wouldn't say anything about this Central Kingston member. No, he's my friend. <laughs> Madam Speaker, a few generations ago, the collective psyche of Vincentians harbored three main impossibilities. One, was a bridge across the Arabica Dry River. Two, an international airport. Three, universal access to secondary education. These in the psyche were impossibilities. Today, this government has realized all three in 21 years. I mention that because we were challenged to say what we've done in 21 years. And that's only three things. I'm just talking about three things which were impossibilities. And we did not inherit that from anybody's pipeline. They came from the bosom of the ULP. The bridge of the Rabakot River has transformed, has transformed the north of our country. International airport, I mean, everybody is seeing what it is doing today. And the education revolution, Madam Speaker, is on the move, is on the move. The health and wellness system, which we, Madam Speaker, which we like to take for granted, is improving and expanding. We have smart hospitals, Union Island, Georgetown, Chateaubelle. We have polyclinics at Stubbs, Mariaqua, 
book comment. We have been able to decentralize services. I don't think many people know that we have X-ray services in Mariaqua at the Levi Later Health Center. At book comment, we also have services like that at the Mother Mel Medical um, Center at Georgetown. So we are expanding and we are improving the health services. And over the last 20, 21 years, this has been the case. Radiology and laboratory services all over St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And to top it off, Madam Speaker, there is a large, percent, a large percentage of our medical doctors are Vincentians, products of the education revolution. That is why I'm proud to congratulate this political party called the ULP and to congratulate its leadership. In education, there's an emphasis on equity and access. I remember before the ULP came to power, the problem we had with people coming to the ministry, going to the Ministry of Education, with tears in their eyes, asking officials to have pity on them by taking their children to school, into school, secondary schools. It happened a lot. It was like carnival. It was a sad carnival. A festival of tears, Madam Speaker. Nowadays, we talk about equity in education. We talk about universal access to secondary education. Getting a secondary education in those days, Madam Speaker, was something people looked up to as a, as a status symbol. Now it's on everybody's lips. It's normal. You just walk into a school. Even tertiary education now. I know the Minister of Education mentioned that in 2001, you had four people with degrees in the primary schools. Now you have over 500. Once upon a time, we had, we had the doctors at the hospital. I don't remember. You couldn't even pronounce their names, you remember? They came from far, other side of the world. Now you go down to the hospital or wherever else. People who you know. I said this before here in this house. People who you know, their parents. Products of the revolution, the education revolution. So this government deserves the applause, as I said, because it has been a transformative government. It has been a caring government. And moreover, it has been a revolutionary government. And we continue to do like that. As I close, Madam Speaker, I'm reminded of Galatians 6, 9. Let us not go weary of well-doing because our, our harvest soon approaches. We are already beginning to reap that harvest. I'm obliged. Thank you. Honorable Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to offer congratulatory remarks. Firstly, to a woman who, it's no secret, has been a mentor to me over the years in the person of Rene Mercedes Batiste. On her recent re-election as Speaker of the House of the OECS Assembly. And over the years, we have seen and heard how remarkable this woman is. And the fact that her capabilities and capacity transcends national lines is something that we must recognize. And once again, I congratulate her. Madam Speaker, secondly, I offer congratulations to the Unity Labor Party on 
21 years in office. Five victories, five in a row. Madam Speaker, I congratulate the ULP on 21 years of vision. Because without vision, the people will perish. Things that were seemingly impossible were apparently possible under the Unity Labour Party administration. Madam Speaker, I congratulate the ULP on 21 years of development. And I know that there are a lot of people who will be critical and they will deny that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been transformed over the last 21 years. And they will be critical to say that more could be done. But we always have to remember context and the context in which St. Vincent and the Grenadines exist as a small island developing state. We are not immune to matters that will derail our progress and development. But notwithstanding those many challenges, St. Vincent and the Grenadines under the ULP administration has seen development. Madam Speaker, I say congratulations to the Unity Labour Party for development in the sector of education. And it has been said repeatedly, but I will say it again, because the education revolution is a cornerstone of this administration. And it has changed the lives of many Vincentian children. And Madam Speaker, I am proud to say that I am a child of the education revolution. This administration made a pledge that by 2025, every household in St. Vincent and the Grenadines will have at least one university graduate. And we are well on track. Some houses already have two and three and counting. Madam Speaker, I am relatively young but I am old enough to remember what it was like under the NDP administration when it came to education, especially university education. Not denying that persons didn't acquire a university degree, but if you were to search every household, university graduates were few and far in between. And under this administration, we have seen an increase in the amount of students acquiring bachelor's degrees, master's, and PhDs. Madam Speaker, students, if they don't get a scholarship, they can go to the banks and they can apply for an economically disadvantaged student loan. That was a feature that was not present as it relates to grants, this administration over the 21 years has increased the amount of grants given to students to assist them in financing their university journey. Just was it last year or earlier this year, we, we allocated over 500 tuition grants to students in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is a government who is serious about the education of our children. Madam Speaker, I congratulate the Unity Labour Party. And every time I mention the party, please, I want it to be implied that the congratulations extend to the Honorable Prime Minister. Congratulate the Honorable Prime Minister and this administration on solid foreign policy. My colleague, the Honorable Minister of Finance, went into detail about the many things, and I wouldn't repeat them. 
But just to say that in the short time I have been in my position, it is clear that the respect for the name St. Vincent and the Grenadines is tall. There's no denying that. In every forum I have appeared, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is well respected. And it comes to something, and it is indicative of our solid foreign policy. We are not anybody's puppet. And we are not anybody's echo chamber. We have the ability and the capability to think for ourselves on matters of foreign policy. We don't posture. We work on solid policy. Madam Speaker, I congratulate the ULP for 21 years of comradery. Unity in the name Unity Labour Party counts for something. And it means something. I often hear people critical of the government, whether they're joking, whether they want to be smart, say that, but what them, all of them singing from the same song sheet. Madam Speaker, for the people who know me, I consider myself a musical connoisseur. I have a good ear for music. And I will tell you this, and all the people who are critical, that an audience would rather sit and listen to a choir who is harmonious. If everybody is singing in their own key and their own tune, nobody's going to listen to that choir. So unity comes for something. And I can tell you in the short time I have been here, as I said before in this honorable house, I have been welcomed. And there is a spirit of unity and camaraderie here. And long may it continue. Madam Speaker, finally, I will congratulate the Unity Labour Party and the Honorable Prime Minister on steadfast leadership of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am a firm believer that leaders must lead. And for the 21 years, this administration has led the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We don't flip-flop. We don't play cat and mouse games when it comes to the safety, the development, and the prosperity of our people. So I congratulate this administration on the continued steadfast leadership. Madam Speaker, I say cheers to 21 years and cheers to many more years and long live the ULP. I am much obliged. Honorable Senator Morgan. Madam Speaker, I too rise to offer congratulatory remarks to this government for this historical milestone and achievement of 21 years in government. This is no easy feat, Madam Speaker. Of course, it would be remiss of me to not offer congratulations to the Honorable Prime Minister for his visionary leadership which is reflected in the social democratic policies of the ULP and this government that has resulted in significant transformations in the lives of the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized persons, the working class, the poor and working class people of this country. Madam Speaker, 20 years is one generation. 
And nowhere can you see the illustration of the progress made than by a comparison between generations. The honorable leader of the opposition spoke about empirical facts, but these are not empirical facts. These are significant transformations in the lives of people, real flesh and blood people. And I am living proof of the transformative power, transformative power of education. I'm a child of the education revolution. When I compare my mother's generation with my generation and my nephew's generation, it's significant. My mother was born in 1955. She'll be upset with me for telling her age. But <laughs> in those days, she was not able to complete a secondary education. She finished her schooling at about 11 years old after doing the school evening exam. And that was expected to be it for her. That was expected to be it for her. However, due to her resilience and due to the policies of this government, on education, my mother, at the age of 50 years old, was able to obtain a university degree. So there are persons who are speaking very dismissively about the education revolution without understanding the transformative effect. Nobody can deny that Opportunities have been created for persons. Opportunities that previously had not been there. Whether or not they choose to avail themselves of these opportunities, that is a different story. You could take a horse to, a to the well, to the water, but you can't make it drink. But you cannot dispute that the opportunities are there. This government has to be congratulated for the role that they have played in education. I remember at one year, there were at all three campuses of the University of the West Indies, a valedictorian from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Unprecedented, unprecedented. And that is a result of the education revolution and the policies of this government. Poor people, children have advanced as the Honorable Minister of Health said, when you go to the hospital, who's serving you? Poor people, children, persons who are able to go to university, whether you got a scholarship, whether you got an economically disadvantaged loan, whether you got assistance through a bursary or a grant, it is undisputable that education is a priority for this government. And for the development of this country and the people of this country. When you consider the ability to access housing, government workers in particular could go and access mortgages, 100% mortgages to purchase their home. When you want to talk about generational wealth and the ability to pass on something to your children, they now can have a property that they could pass on to their children and leave a legacy, something for the, the upcoming generation. This government has to be congratulated for its transformative policies. When you look at these social protection programs, St. Vincent is a small island developing state. We are very susceptible to all kind of economic and environmental shocks. And this government is cognizant of that and has put cushions in place to take care of our people. The leader of the opposition would refer to it pejoratively as handouts. 
But if you conceptualize that these are essential social interventions to protect the poor and vulnerable people in the society, that would never be said. This government has to be congratulated for its paternalistic approach and care and consideration to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and their development. As I said, you just need to look, make a comparison between the generations. My mother didn't have many of the opportunities for development that I had. If those policies had been in place back then, the current policies for education, for social protection, for housing, who knows where she and many other persons in this society could have elevated to. You can't dispute that there are people who grew up in abject poverty who now, as a result of the policies of this administration, are able to raise their standard of living. They're university educated, they can access mortgages, some of them could send the children to private schools, expensive, give the children an expensive private school education. This has to be commended. Madam Speaker, my mother walked so that I could run, but under the policies of this administration, the upcoming generation, children like my nephew, are going to be able to, as the Prime Minister likes to say, fly like eagles with their wings unclipped. This is no small feat, 21 years of good governance, sustainable development, and improvement in the lives, tangible improvements in the lives of our people. It's not empirical. I just gave you anecdotal evidence. Real life stories of persons who have, whose lives have been touched and transformed on account of the policies of this administration. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, I too would like to extend my, my congratulations to the Honorable Miss, the former Miss Rennie Batiste, who, is, who has been elected as the Speaker of the OECS Assembly. If we are serious about women's empowerment and the self-actualization of women and girls, she has set a great example for us to look at. I also wish to congratulate three young ladies who on International Women's Day, it's very symbolic that on International Women's Day, they were awarded the Entrepreneurial Elite Award for their entrepreneurial efforts. And this was a, a, a business plan competition, which was a collaboration between the Republic of Taiwan and this government. So we are creating opportunities for entrepreneurship for young women. So I would like to congratulate Ms. Sophia Searles of Searles Agro Products, Ms. Kenna Cattells of, I think her, her business is called Kinexio, and also Jessica, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I don't know if it's Jaja, Jessica Jaja of Beckway Threadworks. Three exceptional young ladies who have proven themselves. And are setting a great example of entrepreneurship and female empowerment in this country. Madam Speaker, that is the extent of my, congratula my congratulatory remarks. I'm obliged.
Honorable member for East Kingstown. It really was not my intention. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, it really was not my intention to participate or to take advantage of your, generous, of your generosity in allowing us to speak extensively um, in making congratulatory remarks. But I figured this might, this might be a once in a long time um, opportunity, so let me take advantage of it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really here to be critical of the sentiments and congratulations expressed by members, honorable members from the other side um, with re in relation to the Unity Labour Party's 21 years of being in government. <clears throat> but I think it would be remiss of me, excuse my voice, I have a, a bug. I don't know where it came from, but hopefully it'll go away soon. No, it's not COVID. I'm very, very, very COVID free. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Never had it and don't intend to get it. <laughs> Prime Minister Flu. All right. Anyway, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, um, <clears throat> by the same token and maybe in a, in a contrary um, method of expression, I would like to also congratulate, or should I say highlight, some very important issues which I believe were either deliberately uh, ignored or were not politically expedient to be expressed. And I would also like to use the opportunity to congratulate my own New Democratic Party for during its time in government not have been at the helm of these realities. One, the level of unemployment in this country is at an unprecedented high. And I am giving you the data, so you, if you want to be vexed with me, vex with me, but the data is the data. Honorable and numbers don't lie. Honorable members. Yes, Madam Speaker. Just as you are taking advantage of my, what was the word that you used? Generosity. My generosity. Like you're getting hungry, Let Madam Speaker. <laughs> is it not time for us also to be? And I will wrap up quickly if you allow me to. No. I want to allow you to speak on the congratulatory remarks, but as I have reminded all of the members here today, and I, am, I will again give the credit where it is due, to the Honorable Member for Central Kingston. Remember, this is on the congratulatory remarks. We will speak to content and we will be ever mindful of time. Please continue. I am very aware of, of, of your, um, your words of guidance, reminder, but I, am, I have been so well guided. But let me continue, Madam Speaker, as you have granted me permission so to do. As I was saying, I would like to congratulate the New Democratic Party for being what goes down in record as the most effective steward of our economy from an organizational standpoint because it was not under the New Democratic Party that the unprecedented highest level of unemployment has been realized. It was not under the New Democratic Party that the highest level of poverty in this country ever was realized. It was not under the New Democratic Party that our level of economic growth was the worst in the OECS and was cut in half in less than 10 years under the Unity Labour Party. It was not under the New Democratic Party's administration that the highest debt in this country was realized. And I can go on and on and on. It was 
under the New Democratic Party, and we, we hear people talking about their experiences in secondary school and primary school and all these kinds of things. But I cannot recall ever in the history of the New Democratic Party's governance from five students being without teachers, as is presently the case today. So, so when we're talking about congratulating and showcasing, showcasing, showcasing your quote-unquote marvelous performance, it is important that the people of this country understand that all is not well as has been portrayed today. I could go on and say a lot more, but Madam Speaker, I respect you. I respect the fact that we've been here for over five hours, and so I will rest my case here. I'm quite sure I'd get other opportunities to continue along this line. I'm much obliged. Honorable Minister of Transport and Works. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to congratulate the... Ma Madam Speaker, if the Honorable Prime Minister deputies may give me a four minute, please. It is really extending judgment to have us arrive in the Parliament at 10 o'clock. And at 4 o'clock, we are still not able to proceed to a lunch break. I mean, I do not know what record we want to prove, but it is really beyond reason and conscience. Simply, as it's appearing and unfolding now, that this has been a planned activity that every single member of the Unity Labour Party will speak on the subject of congratulations on a day when we have questions, some 20, some of the questions presented. What, what, what kind of management are we really considering? Six hours, six hours in the parliament without a break is unconscionable, unreasonable, and poor political hygiene. It is ridiculous. I should not be subjected to this. No business place in town, no organization intends to have its employees at work by law for more than a four-hour period. We need, we need to review this. If the minister wants to make his contribution, we should at least take a break, have lunch, or whatever we want to call it, and come back here and let him have his say. But to have me sitting here now from six, going to seven or eight hours, is irresponsible, and does not speak to my health and my consideration. I really, really am, am not happy and comfortable okay, with this right. kind of planning. And this is the lead of government business. Feels that you are in government, and this represents good governance, to have your parliamentarians sitting through a lunch hour, which should have been 12 o'clock, four hours after, I'm sitting to hear you for another how much ever minutes. I don't know, Madam Speaker, but I appeal to your judgment. We yeah. ought to take a break, and you may come back, and you may have a say. Very well. Perhaps I invite the leader of government business, Deputy Prime Minister, to respond. Sure. As I would have recalled over the years, once we are dealing with a specific item on the agenda, we try to conclude on that agenda item before we proceed to break on any of, of, the, of um, getting out of here for lunch or whatever it is. And so for the morning, of course, we have been on congratulations and it has been very extended. And I thought that once the congratulatory message agenda is complete, then we can break and go for lunch. If it is the feeling of the, the house that we should break now and come back. But you have raised, 
you are you are a member of the house you have raised it but you're the leader and i'm the trying leader. to address it leaders must lead. of course and that is what i will do therefore therefore madam speaker on the agenda item we will continue on we will continue on the the congratulations and therefore madam speaker i stand to make my remarks on the issue of just, just, congratulations. Just, just a moment. I've been here for six hours, Madam Speaker. Order. And the, the, we Honourable have members. The house. This is unreasonable. Honourable members. Unreasonable. Honourable member, just a moment. Just a moment, Honourable members. Come on, man. Honourable members. Not even a break for members' convenience. Honourable members. Come on. Just a moment, honorable members. Honorable member, uh, honorable members. Honorable members, I'm on my feet. Just a moment, honorable members. Honorable members. We have indeed been here for a significant period of time and persons are indeed probably in need of a break. And so I'm going to, I myself need a break and I'm going to suspend this honorable house for 10 minutes. 10 minutes it is and we will be back. House stands suspended. <laughs>
will stand resume. Honorable Minister of Transport and Works. Because this is a can be safety matter uh, on settled on resolved. If you will. The the objection and the comments raised by my by the member for Central Kingstown are the members on this side, Madam Speaker. They are the most reasonable of comments to be made and expectations to be met. And so I don't want the notion to be that somehow they are dismissed or people to feel that they were not entitled to be raised. We have been here for a long time, and this has been, in my view, an abuse of the congratulatory remarks process. And this is, it's unprecedented. I tried to raise this earlier. I know in times when you've had obituary like with Sir James, we had this elaborate scheme to try and limit the number of persons who would contribute. But here we have a deliberate ploy and party members on the other side to essentially speak for the rest of the day. Um, but that being what it is, Madam Speaker, what I would ask now, the horse is already bolted. Minute, just a minute, Honorable. I see that the Honorable Minister of Finance is on his feet. Honorable Member, why are you standing? Madam Speaker, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition just said that essentially this House is a victim of a deliberate ploy by this, this side of the House. I would like to remind the Honorable Member, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, that four members of his side of the House have spoken in the same congratulatory remarks for lengthy periods of time. So unless they are co-conspirators in this plan, it is clearly a fallacy. Now, I agree, Madam Speaker, as with, and I am in full, and I am them with the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. This is unprecedented. It got out of hand and all the rest of it. But the fact of the matter is, there was a congratulatory remark that is given annually by the, the Honorable Senator Francis. This one, this time, there was a decision taken by the opposition to rise in defiance, to, to discount, to, to answer back, to play politics. And then there was a response on our side. But to say that this is some deliberate ploy is absolutely false. The honorable member knows that at the beginning of the, before the meeting began, I went over to him and told him what our plans were with the bills for the day. There's no deliberate ploy here. The ploy, the, there's no ploy. Something got out of control. They participated to the same extent that we participated. So let's not have any narrative now as if there was some, some ploy. I'm, willing, I'm fully willing to hear the Honorable uh, Leader of the Opposition, but the, I take umbrage, Madam Speaker, with his assertion um, and his attempt to craft a narrative that this side of the Honorable House had some sort of a plan. Minister Francis spoke. The next Honorable Member on the feet was a member for West Kingston, and that is where the back and forth began. So, so there's, no, there's no ploy here, Madam Speaker. Honorable Leader, oh, Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member will take double umbrage then because I'm not resiling from what I said. This is a situation that could have been managed. It wasn't. Every single member on the other side talk. And you think we're going to sit in this house here and you carry on with your long stories and just not balance the scales? We will not do that. And don't try and make it seem that somehow this is some creation on our part. We have the questions we want answered. That's the business I want to get to. Well, that's you will say that. I have my own interpretation. Okay. And that's what members, it says here. What I would ask, Madam Speaker, what I, what I rose to my feet for, yes. and what the Honorable Member um, interrupted, is that even if the horse is already bolted, we can still bring some order here. The Member, the, the Honorable Minister is going to speak. I think, Madam Speaker, it is at a time of the day when some limit should be put as to when it should be concluded and that we should try to get out of here to get back to answer the question by some reasonable time. I would suggest half past four. Well, just a moment, honorable members. I want to just point honorable members' attention to stand in order 22, 2, and 22, 3. And by way of general comment, as the learning from Erskine may 
lets us know, and I'll quote, the real basis of government's control over business of the house lies in what is our equivalent of 22.2, where it says, subject to the provisions of these standing orders, government business shall have precedent at every meeting of the house, except on the first day at the third meeting. And it goes on. 22.3 is also of significance in that government sets the agenda, and that is clear. The leader of government business, I cannot adjourn the house, I cannot um, suspend the house for the luncheon period. So I, am, I can suspend for members' convenience, which I have done. I would like to hear, just a moment, honorable member. I would like to hear from the leader of government business as to the way in which we will proceed as that, those are the rules. Madam Speaker, I would like us to conclude on the congratulatory remarks and then we proceed for our luncheon interval. Very well, I will ask you then to be cognizant of the time and of course content as I have issued that general guidance to most members who have contributed here, Honorable Minister you, of Thank Transport you. and Works. Ma Madam Speaker, on a point of order, I seek your guidance on the House rules, hours of sitting. I know you have just referenced your discretion with respect to 12-6, where you may suspend for people, members' convenience. Yes. But I, I, I ask for your direction with respect to 12-1, 2, and 4, and to raise with you whether the very 12-6 that you speak about is not, does not infer that it, it resides within you to so guide the House if you feel that in the proceedings of the House that a particular period of time, whether it's sufficient, inordinate, prolonged, or challenging, requires you, as Speaker of the House, to make an intervention. My submission to you, which I made before, Madam Speaker, is that as a member of this House, I ought not to be subjected to a state in which my health is imperiled. It is for good reasons that it represents good practice as organizations and in business that after a period of four hours people be allowed to refresh. We are asked to be here in this house now wearing masks from 10 o'clock at a time <coughs> when we are COVID constrained. And I'm going into a seventh hour or thereabout in challenging situations, wearing a mask, hungry, and with a genuine need to have a meal so that I, my, my brains can be so fed that I can participate in the house shows. I am saying not to give consideration to those norms is a derogation. And that it resides within you and the hours of the sitting of the house to make a judgment call and, and to advise, if necessary, the leader of government business. And, and, and I'm not satisfied, Madam Speaker, just to take me for granted that I can be here for seven, seven and a half hours Honorable and come member. back here and be, and be speaking on questions at nine o'clock. Honorable member, I, that's, that's what I'm appealing I, I hear, to you. I hear, I hear your appeal as it pertains to your question for guidance on 12134. We have not in any way, as of now, infringed on any of those provisions as of now. As it pertains to your question for intervention, the most that the speaker can do is, as it pertains to the, um, the suspension that you're probably asking for, is to allow for members to ventilate the point as I have so done. But it is not within my purview. As far as I have seen, both in terms of the learning and the practice, because those matters, as especially as they relate to the suspension for prolonged periods and more significantly the adjournment of the house, those rest within the 
the domain of the lead of the of, of the lead of government business in this instance. Perhaps what I can do, not by way of ruling, but by way of suggestion, is to ask of the Honorable Minister of Transport and Works to be measured in his comments, mindful and supportive as we all are of the number of hours that we've been here. And I think that what we have done is we've spent 15 minutes or so that may have well have already concluded his, not, that is not in any way to discount what you're saying, but I want us, but, you, but, but, but listen to what I am saying. It is not, you see, it is amazing. We must not just extract what suits us. I am making the critical point that it is not to discount what has been said. Indeed, I agreed that I myself had needed a break. I am, I'm, we are all supportive of, 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 the, of the position that these are not regular circumstances. But I do not, it is my considered opinion that I do not have the authority to adjourn or to suspend for a prolonged period. And that has to come on a motion. It has to come from a motion from the, from the, the government side. Because 80, sub, sub, um, standing order 812 yes. does say that you are responsible for the management and general administration of the assembly chamber. Yes. So even if you can move a motion, you can yes. advise the member to so do. Well, I have, I have, what I have done through your contributions is to allow, allow for the views to be before the Honorable House. Honorable Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise to make my contribution to the debate where today we are ordering, well, I'm offering congratulations to the Unity Labour Party on its 21 years in government in this country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And so, Madam Speaker, I want to thank Almighty God for his mercies and his goodness and his strength to be here in this parliament for 21 consecutive years, coming through the doors of these hollowed walls as an elected member in this parliament. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the constituency of North Winod. For they have supported me over the years. And uh, without them, I couldn't have been here. Why I congratulate them, Madam Speaker, and to congratulate them is that in 1998, when you lost the general elections, 8-7, that the leader of our party then, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, he called me and said to me that, of course, there were two positions on the opposition bench. for senators, and whether or not I would like to accept. I said, Prime Minister, in entering the parliament of this country, my preference 
is to have the constituency of North Wynwood voting for me and to enter into this parliament. And in 2001, we won the elections. And for 21 consecutive years, I've been a member of this parliament. And I want to thank them very much for their support. Madam Speaker, I want to also thank the Honorable Prime Minister and to congratulate him for the opportunity to work and to serve with him along these 21 years. I recall when the party came together in 1994. That is when our political journey actually started. And so, over these years, he has helped to mold me as to where I am today. And there's no doubt about it that my own observation is that he is a committed son of the soil and will do anything for the progress and development of this, this country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I watched him a few months ago where his blood was shed coming to this parliament, but then turned around and said, forgive them, forgive them, Lord. And this is the kind of man you're talking about. Madam Speaker, I hold the Prime Minister in very high regard. I'm very respectful to the Prime Minister because I've sat in the presence of the Prime Minister along with other intellects, not only here in St. Vincent and throughout the Caribbean, but even in the wider world. And undoubtedly, he would have been a force to reckon with. I want to thank him for the knowledge he has imparted, not only to me, but to others throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I want to thank him and to congratulate him for his courage, for he has stood up to many nations and peoples who think that they are of a much more higher standing. Madam Speaker, I want to thank him for his stewardship. And I really, I really realize that many would have be benefited tremendously as he would have been the leader of our party and this country. Madam Speaker, it is this morning in my own reflections, reading Deuteronomy chapter 20, when I reflect on Dr. Gonsalves and the path he has taken us through, and I reflect on Deuteronomy chapter 20. Ralph Gonzalez, the Prime Minister of this country, is a tree that we should prune and fertilize so that he can continue to bear fruit for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
Madam Speaker, I recall the Prime Minister in 1998. As a matter of fact, it was the 8th of December, 1998, where the Prime Minister pronounced on three promises to us that after the general elections, that you would insist that there is general elections, that there's a general election before 2003. He indicated equally that the Unity Labour Party will win the next general elections and that the, law, the ULP would be in government for a long, long time. And so, Mr. Madam Speaker, of all of the, these pronouncements by the Prime Minister, all of them have come to pass. And that is why, that is why I respect the Prime Minister for his wisdom that is why I respect the Prime Minister for the way he has molded a number of us to bring benefit to this country. And that in 2001, he assembled a great team to take this party forward. And we had the likes of Vincent Beach, Louis Straker, Jordan McGill, Mike Brown, Rene Batiste, Conrad Sears, Selman Walters, Gerald Thompson, Dougie Slater, Clayton Borgen, and your humble servant. And Madam Speaker, after we won the elections, we began to build a country and to bring back respect to a rudderless country at that time. St. Vincent and the Grenadines at that time seems to be sailing in the wind without a rudder. And so we began the work. His, his theme from day one was to ensure that we build a post colonial, many sided, competitive economy. And I can say to you that many nights, many nights, I would leave the cabinet 10, 11, 12 o'clock in the, in the night and up to 1 o'clock in the morning. And when we said, Prime Minister, it's already midnight, he would say, we have five years' work to do for 20 years. And so, we began the political journey. Madam Speaker, in building St. Vincent and the Grenadines, there are no more areas that he would have looked at so as to move forward in a modern economy. And uh, I sit here sometimes, including today, and the comments I hear from the opposition side, sometimes you wonder because pronouncements are made as though they are facts. Let's take for argument's sake. I sat here and I listened a comment from the opposition benches where one member refuted that garbage collection was shown in Vincent and the Grenadines before we came to office in 2001. 
And I want to say to this house that it was in October of 2001 Daniel Cummins, who was the manager of the Water Authority, was called to the cabinet to discuss the matter of garbage collection in that, in that, in that, in, in that year, 2001, October. And the Prime Minister made it abundantly clear that we are here to discuss garbage collection in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Prime Minister said, is the CWSA is willing and capable of doing the work? He said it, it is possible, but over time. The Prime Minister said, no, I want it to be done now. He said it cannot be done. The Prime Minister said, okay. Since the CWSA cannot do that, I am going to find another institution who can do it. He then said, okay, we can look into it and have it done within the next six months. The Prime Minister said, he turned to me, as a representative for the constituency of North Windward, He said, when would you like your garbage to be collected in your constituency? I said, Prime Minister, garbage is a menace in my constituency. And if it is possible as of tomorrow morning, and it can be done, I'll be happy. The Prime Minister turned to Gerald Thompson, the representative for the constituency uh, Madam Speaker, of in as much North Leeward. I, I regret the interruption. I think we are again descending into a debate. All right. And that's, that does not represent congratulatory remarks. Honorable member. I mean, I'm Honorable seeking the guidance. Yes. Honorable member. Thank you. Honorable Minister of Transport. I want to just again to remind you. I was actually just getting ready to remind you that we're on the congratulatory remarks. Fine. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But as I say... <laughs> however, Madam Speaker, I said that I have sat here and I've listened to these comments. Just a moment. And just so... A, no, no, no. Hold on. Just a it moment. It is because of that. I, Just a moment, Honorable sorry. Minister of Transport. I see that the Honorable... Yes, Madam Speaker. On a point of order, point the Honorable order. Minister is misleading the House. Maybe he cannot recall or he did not understand. Just a moment, Honorable Minister. Manners don't come cheaply. Either he doesn't understand or he doesn't recall. The discussion he is referring to took place between... The Prime Minister, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, and the then project um, manager, Mr. O'Reilly Lewis, who was asked the questions and who responded. And in fact, I recall vividly in that discussion, the Prime Minister took a tirade at the young engineer, and I had to intervene and said to the Prime Minister, we will carry out your commands. So don't bring me in what you don't know about. What you don't know about, don't talk. Okay. If something Let us Madam Speaker, our team continue to work for this country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the education revolution was one of the areas to which the Prime Minister insisted that we must have within this first five years. And we set the stage for the education revolution within that first five year period, of course. Other members of, on this side will have spoken on it. But I just want to say that one of the things within the education revolution that I am happy about is that before the ULP came to to office, 
you could not have had many young students on the street of St. Vincent and the Grenadines speaking different languages. And I'm happy that the education revolution has offered different languages to us so that we can participate in international affairs across the world. Right. We, set, we set aside working on the housing revolution. Minister Francis, the Minister for Urban Development at this time, started the process. And then I continued from there. When I left the Ministry of Housing in, 19, in 2020, the Ministry of Housing would have built within that period of time from 2001 until 2020, 1,898 houses at the end of 2020. And since then, the Ministry of Housing continues to do its work. Already we have, we have gone past over 2,000 houses built in this country. And with the eruption of the last Sufre volcano, where over 600 homes were damaged and or destroyed, the Ministry of Housing will continue to repair houses in this country to bring a better way of life to those who would have been affected. Madam Speaker, we worked on social security because in those days, poverty was very vivid in this country. We worked on improved health care Madam Speaker, if you know what existed before, but some of it was borne out in some earlier speeches. We worked on infrastructural development for this country, notwithstanding the Rabuka Bridge in, within my own constituency, the Argyle International Airport, even the roads in this country did a tremendous amount of work on roads in this country. We ensure that we work on good governance and the rule of law. And in all of our work, the camaraderie that existed to that extent, we would have never seen anyone in our team resigned fired, or sent home for any cause. I'm happy that I would have been a part of a team that would have brought tremendous benefit to this country. Madam Speaker, after serving 21 years, I believe that I have made a great contribution. 21 years, historically, means a lot in this country. For after adult suffrage, 21 years would have meant that you would have become of age. And so, At this time, as we reflect on our work and we look forward to the future, Madam Speaker, it is important that we look and to see how we renew this great party 
the, U, the Unity Labour Party. As I indicated earlier on, Madam Speaker, congratulations was always in order. When, in 1998, when Sir Vincent Beach, who was at the time the opposition leader, came to us and said, I think it is time for me to move on and to pass the mantle over to the political leader then, who was Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. And so, Sir Vincent, in 1998, passed the button on to Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. And we were much younger those days. And so, the time has come when the party will be looking to young, the younger generation to take the party forward. So as we reflect on the past, Madam Speaker, we celebrate our achievements, but we continue to look towards and to chart a new way forward. But even in doing so, we recognize the difficulties. We recognize the influences, particularly the outside influences that would affect our policies and programs going forward. But I believe that setting the, plat the platform within the last 21 years is that even at the next general elections, that, that platform will set us on a path to win the next general elections for another five-year term. Today, we celebrate for five terms in government, 21 years. And so congratulations are in order, Madam Speaker, for the Unity Labour Party and uh, for all of the councils, the supporters who would have supported the party over the years. Congratulations are in order. I've equally sat here and I've heard comments. And I've heard positive weaknesses of the work that was done 21 years ago. And I'm happy that even when I vacate, my own position that there are a number of young, talented individuals who can take this party forward. Madam Speaker, congratulations to the ULP for 21 years in government. Much obliged. Honorable Minister. <laughs> We haven't Ma gotten to confirmation of the minutes. But Madam Speaker, <laughs> I believe that before we take the break, I want to, on the 12-5, move that the proceedings of today's sitting be exempted from the provisions of the hours of sitting at this meeting. Honorable members, the question is that the proceedings of today's sitting be exempted from the provisions of the standing, hour, standing orders hours of sitting. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. 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 As many as are of the contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Honorable Minister of Transport.
Madam Speaker, I beg to move the suspension of the sitting at this time for our luncheon interval and to be back here in one hour's time. So, Minister of Transport, I think there, there is some voice that perhaps the hour is not a sufficient amount of time. Well, we can, we can say one and a half hours. One and a half one hours. One and a half hours. Um, one and a half hours. Madam Speaker. Okay. All right. So it's now just about mm -hmm. five o'clock. We come back at 6.30. Yes. Honorable mm -hmm. members, the question is that this that the sitting do stand, stand suspended until 6.30. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as are of the contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, how stand suspended.